so um, basically that's the situation uh, council we're just uh, confirming at the sidebar here that uh, the time estimates I've given you are what they have uh, stated to me one day for both juries uh, and up to one day for the uh, blue jury if that much uh, and that would be the end of the uh, testimonial phase of the case and then early next week we would begin uh, the argument there will be a uh, need for the lawyers and uh, the court to discuss jury instructions and uh, we'll either fit that in during the balance of this week or uh, which would be my preference if we can do that I don't know if we will but if we could we we will do that Otherwise, it might be that we'd have to do that on Monday, but I'll certainly let you know more about that before we get to the end of the week. But the testimony part of the trial is winding down, and uh, we're getting to the point where the arguments will be made, and then I'll instruct the juries, and then deliberations will begin. Um, there is some testimony today that uh, will be presented to the blue jury. It's not very lengthy, but uh, there is some that uh, relates only to the blue jury, so we'll keep the blue jury here for that purpose. The reason I didn't have you come out earlier was because there was um, need to get more information and uh, discuss it with the lawyers before we could uh, get to the point of giving you uh, the information that I just have uh, provided to you. So um, what I'm going to do in a moment is order uh, that the blue jury return, or strike that, that the gold jury come back tomorrow at 9 o'clock, but we'll call you uh, this afternoon if we don't need you and let you know that we don't need you and that we'll be proceeding with the blue jury. And uh, then uh, the blue jury will be told to come back tomorrow at 9 o'clock and uh, one way or another we'll um, have you here unless, um, again, we give you a call this afternoon and let you know that the situation has changed. Um, there's no absolutes in this world, no guarantees, but uh, that's the schedule that's been provided and uh, hopefully we'll be able to follow through on that and get the case to you for your decisions uh, early next week as far as the uh, gold jury is concerned and then the blue jury uh, following that. All right, anybody have any questions then as far as what we're doing here? The scheduling or anything else or any other uh, questions you have about the procedures okay then as to the uh, gold jury we'll see you back here tomorrow at uh, nine o'clock unless you hear otherwise and i'm sorry for the delay but uh, we're getting close to the end here and are you ready with the uh, blue jury okay all right um if uh, counsel for the, uh, I, I want you available this morning, so if you want to leave for a few minutes, you can. Thank you. All right. All right, uh, we'll proceed with testimony before the uh, blue jury as soon as that witness comes in. Your Honor, our next witness would be Guy Delicio. All right, step forward, please. <coughs> You do? Yes. Okay. Sounds like you said I don't. I swear to the truth. You do. Okay. So I do. Okay. My name is Guy Aaron Delisio. D E capital L I S I O. Mr. Delisio, where are you from? Uh, originally, I'm from Staten Island, New York. And what do you do for a living? Uh, presently, I drive a concrete mixer. Did you have a different job in August of 1989? Yes, I did. What did you do for a living in August of 1989? Uh, I drove a limousine. And did you drive a limousine for a particular company? Yes, I did. What was the name of the company that you worked for? That would be A1 Limousine Company, Princeton, New Jersey. Okay, that's a, a company that's based in Princeton, New Jersey? Yes. Now, Mr. Delisio, <coughs> directing your attention to August 31st, 1989, uh, were you uh, working as a limo driver for A1 Limousine Company on that particular date? Yes, I was. Okay. Uh, 
I have here a document that's previously been marked as Exhibit 360. May I approach, Your Honor? Yes. Thank you. Mr. Delizio, I'm showing you a one-page document that's been marked as Exhibit 360. Could you look at that and tell uh, the jury whether you recognize it? Uh, yes, I do. Uh, and is that uh, a document that uh, is uh, prepared or maintained uh, during the course of uh, the business of A1 limousine service. Yes, it is. What's that document called? Uh, that would be a driver's trip sheet. Okay, and is that uh, a document that A1 limousine service provides you? Yes. Okay. And uh, is there information on the uh, document exhibit 360 that tells you what to do? Yes, there is. Okay, would you look at the exhibit in front of you and, and tell us uh, if that is a, uh, an assignment, that, that reflects an assignment that you received from A1 Limousine Service on August thir on, for August 31st, 1989? Yes, it does. All right, and what did this, uh, what were you told to do? I was told to uh, pick up a Mr. Menendez at the Sheraton Center Hotel in New York City. And, uh, drive him to uh, LaGuardia Airport. Okay. And uh, is the, did you, in fact, do that? Yes, I did. Okay. Um, are there places on Exhibit 360 uh, where you, during the course of uh, your work, uh, make notations as to time? Yes, there is. Okay. And is your handwriting on Exhibit 360 in various places? Yes, it is. Okay. Is Exhibit 360 a document that you filled out on August 31st on or about the, uh, the times that you arrived and left various places indicated? Yes. Have you seen Exhibit 360 before today? Uh, yes, I have. <clears throat> All right, now you've told us that you uh, went to the Sheraton Center Hotel in New York to pick up Eric Menendez, is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Do you recognize Eric Menendez? Yes, I do. today? Yes, I do. Okay, and is he the person that you picked up on August 31st? Yes. What time did you pick him up? Uh, I was scheduled to be at the hotel at 10 a.m. I usually arrive a half hour before the scheduled pickup time. Okay, and is, uh, so you arrived at about 9.30? That is correct. And does Exhibit 360 reflect that you wrote down that you arrived at 9.30 a.m. at the hotel? Uh, yes, it does. Okay. What did you do after you arrived at the hotel at 9.30 in the morning? Okay, I proceeded to go inside to the uh, Sheraton Center, use the hotel house phone, and uh, call up Mr. Menendez in his room and let him know that I was downstairs and awaiting him. Did you have a particular room number to call? Uh, I do not recall. Uh, if I believe if you look somewhere on there, it might say it. Yes, it does. Okay. And uh, you called room uh, 2630, is that correct? That's correct. And did you speak to someone? Yes, I did. Okay. And did you, what, what, what happened then? Uh, I spoke to Mr. Menendez directly. I let him know that I was downstairs and uh, he let me know that he would be running a little late and uh, be down as soon as possible. Okay, and what did you do after you had this phone conversation? I uh, went back outside to the limousine and uh, just stood with the limousine and awaited uh, Mr. Menendez to come down. Okay. Did you see Eric Menendez later that morning? Uh, yes, I did. And do you recall what time it was when you saw him? Uh, approximately, first time I saw him would be approximately 10.45. And where was he when you first saw him? Uh, he was coming out of the uh, Sheraton Hotel, Sheraton Center Hotel, coming towards me to greet me at the limousine. And you were parked at the front door? Yes, directly in front. Was uh, Eric Menendez alone or with somebody when you first saw him coming out of the hotel? I recall him coming out alone and approaching me alone. Um, at some point, uh, did you notice that there was somebody with Eric Menendez? Yes, I did. And when did you first notice the person that was with Eric Menendez? Uh, I, my recollection tells me just as Mr. Menendez was entering the car, uh, this person's presence was made known to me. All right. 
Um, let me ask you, did you have any conversation with Eric Menendez when he first approached you and got in the car? Yes, he, uh, he had uh, expressed the fact that he was running late and that he needed to make the uh, make the airport for the 12.30 flight, and that uh, could I please do my best to get him there on time? And I said that I would. Okay. Now, were you introduced to the person who was with Eric Menendez? Uh, I was, but not, not on, a, on a name basis. I was so, just told who he was. Okay, and was he, did he describe himself to you in a particular fashion? Yes, he did. How did he describe himself to you? Uh, he described himself as a New York City police detective. Could you describe uh, the person who described himself as a New York City police detective? Excuse me? Could you tell us what he looked like? Uh, my recollection tells me he was approximately 6'2 to 6'3, uh, with gray hair and a mustache. Was he heavy set? Or? Yes. And does the name uh, Andrew Valentine ring a bell in terms of who this person was? The name Andy. Andy, okay. Yeah. Did uh, Eric Menendez have any baggage that you recall? Uh, yes, he did. Uh, I don't recall exactly. Uh, the only thing I could think of, he was traveling light, I know that. He didn't have much with him. I do recall one large uh, tennis bag. Okay. And what airport did you drive to? Uh, that would be LaGuardia Airport in Queens, New York. So you went from Manhattan to Queens? That's correct. Okay. And uh, you indicated that uh, you left the hotel about 10, well, what time did you actually leave the hotel? I actually left the hotel, as it says on the document, at 10.50 a.m. that morning. Okay, and that's a notation that you made at the time you left? Correct. Okay, so you left at 10.50 a.m. Uh, to get to a 12.30 flight. Correct. How did you get to LaGuardia Airport uh, from the Sheraton Center Hotel? Um, <clears throat> there's a number of ways you can do it, but being that Mr. Menendez was pressed for time, I chose to take the most direct route, which was uh, I would be going east over to 6th Avenue, and then I would be going uh, north on 6th Avenue to 59th Street. I would head east on 59th Street over the Queensboro Bridge, come over to Queensboro Bridge, go to Northern Boulevard in Queens, Take Northern Boulevard to 94th Street, make a left turn on 94th Street, go directly into LaGuardia Airport. Okay. Now, directing your attention to uh, the portion of the route uh, that you just described that, that went through Manhattan, okay? Uh, did you make any stops uh, on your way to the airport when you were driving through Manhattan? To my recollection, none whatsoever. Okay. Um, if you had made any stops, uh, would, there be, uh, would there be any notation on your log? Yes, there would. Okay. And is there, in fact, any notation on Exhibit 360 that there were any stops made? Not in between the airport and the hotel, no. Okay. Uh, is, is it your... Did Eric Menendez... Uh, ever make any request of you to stop at any computer stores in Manhattan on the way to the airport? No. Did Eric Menendez ever tell you that he needed uh, to stop at a computer store to buy something for a computer? No. Uh, in your experience as a limousine driver, familiar with right, you're, you're familiar with New York City. Correct. Uh, would you have been able to make the flight if you had stopped uh, twice so that Eric could go out and go into a computer store and then return to the car? In Vegas time. <coughs> Sustained. Uh, you made this trip on a Thursday, uh, in uh, from about 10:50. Uh, to sometime a.m. to sometime afternoon. Is correct. That correct? Uh, what, what is the traffic like in Manhattan at that time of day? Well, the traffic in that, during that particular time of day uh, could be pretty heavy. Okay. Can be pretty heavy. And um, is parking easily available in Manhattan? No. All right, what, uh, so your, your recollection is you made no stops on the way uh, to LaGuardia from the Sheraton Center Hotel? None whatsoever. Uh, what time did you arrive at 
the hotel? Approximately. I'm sorry, at uh, LaGuardia. Uh, approximately 12 o'clock. Okay. And is uh, there a notation on the trip log uh, for a an arrival time at the airport? Yes, it is. Okay. Is that your handwriting? Uh, yes, but uh, to me it doesn't look too legible. Um, I know I wrote 12 p.m. on there. Okay. And that's your recollection as to when you arrived at the airport? Correct. Okay, let me back up. Did you make any stops um, in Queens or any place other than Manhattan on the way to the airport? Other than to pick up Mr. Menendez, no. Okay, once you get out of Manhattan, uh, could you describe what kind of area is it? Is it business? Is it industrial? It's an industrial area, rundown area. Okay, is it an area uh, in which you, uh, there are computer stores? No. Okay. All right, so your recollection is you arrived at the airport at about 12 noon, correct? Correct. Uh, what uh, airline did you take Eric Menendez to? Oh, uh, that would be the Delta Airlines terminal. And that's uh, a recollection you have based on uh, the events of August 31st? Yes. That's also um, the indication that appears on Exhibit 360 that it was a Delta flight. Correct. When you got to the airport, what happened? Oh, I arrived at the airport. Uh, I let Mr. Menendez out of the car. Uh, he went inside the uh, terminal to arrange his tickets and uh, I brought his bags in. And um, after I brought his bags in, I st stood around to see to it that he was you know, getting through the airport with no problem. And once he was ready to go, uh, I left and came back outside with uh, Officer Valentine. Okay, so when uh, he went into the terminal, Officer Valentine accompanied him, is that correct? I do believe, yes. Okay, and you indicated that uh, Officer Valentine came out and joined you at the car? That's correct. Uh, did he get, get in the car? Uh, yes, he did. And where did you go after he got in the car? Uh, he, he told me that I had to drive him back to New York uh, to the, uh, into the vicinity of the hotel so that he could pick up his private car. Okay. Uh, did you ever see Eric Menendez uh, after you dropped him off uh, at the airport? Uh, never again, no. Okay, except today in court, right? Yes. Now, Mr. Delicio, did you go to the U.S. Open on the morning of August 31st before you took Eric to the airport? No. Uh, on the morning of August 31st, uh, did you see a young man who was introduced to you as Eric's brother, Lyle? Uh, no. Uh, on that morning, did you see a, a young woman who was introduced to you as Lyle's girlfriend? No. <clears throat> did you see someone who uh, was introduced to you as Mark Heffernan or described as a tennis coach on the morning of August 31st? No. Uh, did you see someone who was introduced to you as a tennis coach's wife on the morning of August 31st? No. Uh, did you drive a tennis coach and his wife and Eric and Mr. Valentine to the U.S. Open before you went to LaGuardia Airport? No. Did you drive Eric from the U.S. Open back to the hotel and then to LaGuardia Airport? No. I have an exhibit, Your Honor, that has been previously shown to the prosecution. But I'd like to mark exhibit 389. May I approach? Yes. Thank you. Mr. Delisio, I'm showing you an exhibit that's been marked 389. Could you look at that and tell us if you, if it appears to be a driver's log maintained by A1 Limousine Company? Yes, it is. Uh, and is that a document you recognize from the time you worked for A1 Limousine? Yes. And is that a document that gives uh, a driver instructions on a particular assignment? Yes, it does. Okay. Now, Exhibit 389 uh, is re reflects a, an assignment that it was on August uh, 30th. Is that correct? 
I'm sorry, August 31st. Correct. Okay. And is that uh, for a particular person? Uh, it says, uh, when you mean particular person, person to be picked up? Yes. Yes, it is. And who is to be picked up? Uh, I read uh, Mr. Jose Menendez. Okay. And what where, where was Mr. Menendez to be picked up? Uh, the Nassau Inn Hotel. The Nassau Inn Hotel in Princeton, New Jersey. And where was Mr. Menendez to be taken after being picked up at the Nassau Inn? According to this document, it says he had to go to, it looks to me like Newark Airport, uh, which would be in New Jersey, Delta Airlines. What time was the flight out of Newark Airport? I would say, judging from here, 5.30 a.m. Okay, what time was the pickup time? Uh, pickup time, according to this document, would be 3.45 a.m. Okay, and this was 3.45 a.m. on August 31st, 1989, is that correct? That's what it says, correct. May I just have a Your Honor, I believe that would be a stipulation that Exhibit 389 reflects uh, a limousine pickup for Lyle Menendez on the dates and time in indicated in the testimony. <laughs> Thank you. I have nothing further at this time. Cross is out. Thank you, Your Honor. <clears throat> Mr. Delisio, <clears throat> taking a look at uh, the exhibit, do you still have the exhibits in front of you? Exhibit 360? That would be my driver's log, Mr. Yes. Korean. <clears throat> Does that log indicate that the booking date for the pickup of Eric Menendez at the Sheraton Center was on August 30th at 1140 a.m.? <clears throat> That's correct. Does that mean that arrangements were, were made on that date and at that time uh, to pick him up at the Sheraton Center and uh, to take him to LaGuardia for a Delta flight? That's correct. So if after those arrangements were made, another airline was contacted, this document would not reflect any changes that occurred in travel plans after August 30th of 1989, after 11.40 a.m., is that Objection. correct? Objection, calls for speculation. Overall. You could, uh, could you repeat again for me, Mr. Yeah. Koyama? Mr. Delisio, this form, as it's printed, do you have that form in front of you when you pick up the, uh, the passenger? Is that correct? Correct. Out loud? correct. So if changes were made in travel plans after the booking date and time, that would not be reflected on your sheet, is that correct? Yes, it would. Okay. Oh, it would be? Yes, it would. And how would it be? Uh, they, the customer, whoever it may be, would have to call a limo company and explain to them that travel plans were changed. And they, then they would draw up another trip sheet and put the current travel plans on there. Now, if the uh, passenger intended to go to LaGuardia, but if the passenger couldn't get on Delta for the 12.30 flight and instead changed plans and got a ticket for U.S. Air at 12.15, he wouldn't necessarily have to call you to let you know that there were travel plan differences. Is Objection, that correct? Objection, Your Honor. Cause for speculation. Sustain. Compound. Sustain. In any event, you did not, or you are not aware of any differences uh, in travel plans by Eric Menendez? None whatsoever. Okay. Had you ever seen Eric Menendez prior to this date that you, first, that you saw him on August 31st? No. When you saw him coming out of the Sheraton Center after you had spoken to him on the phone, did you know that he was going to be accompanied by a bodyguard? Uh, no. When you first saw him, you didn't recognize who he was then, did you? Absolutely not. I had to have a sign that I held up in order for him to identify me. Okay. So he approached you and explained to you who he was. Correct. And at some point you noticed that he had a bodyguard with him. Correct. Your Honor, I'm going to object before him the question. There's been no testimony that this witness knew he was a bodyguard. 
sustained as in the form of the question, but Ms. Morrissey should be making these objections if anyone. All right, your next question, please. Was there a point at which uh, Mr. Valentine, as you've uh, described, uh, told you that he was a bodyguard for Eric Menendez? Yes. And when was that? Um, I don't quite recall exactly when it was, but I know that he identified himself to me that uh, Lyle Menendez had put in a call to New York City Police Department and asked that protection be given to his brother and that Mr. Valentine was his protection. Now, you indicated that Lyle Menendez had contacted That is what Officer Mr. Valentine, Valentine told me, correct. So he indicated to you that he had spoken to the brother of Eric Menendez. Right. At that point, as the brother, that was the name given to me, not a specific Lyle Menendez, the brother. Did he indicate, did Officer Valentine indicate to you at that time that there was a security problem that... Uh, Objection. Your Honor, calls for hearsay. What does he offer? Just offered to, to show the state of mind of uh, uh, Officer Valentine. Sustained. At some point, the defendant, Eric Menendez, and Officer Valentine got into the limousine. Correct. And you indicated that when you got to the airport, you had to get the bags uh, that were left in the limousine. Now, in addition to this uh, tennis bag, was there a clothing <coughs> suit type bag? There might have been. Okay, you indicated uh, bags that you had to take into the airport for Mr. Menendez, is that correct? Correct. And you indicated that once you got to LaGuardia Airport, uh, Officer Valentine went in with um, Eric Menendez. Correct. Do you remember going to the U.S. Air uh, ticket counter? No. Delta. Do you know where the U.S. Air ticket counter is at that airport? Uh, I do not recall whether or not it's... Uh, LaGuardia Airport basically is set up in uh, different different terminals for different uh, airlines. So the U I, would, I would say the US Air, terminal, uh, USA tic US Air ticket counter would not be <coughs> that close to Delta. Now, when were you first contacted by the defense in this case? Objection relevance. Overall. Shall I answer? Yes. OK, I was first contacted by the defense. Um, well, actually, the first contact I had at all, I don't know whether it was for the defense or what, was years ago. Uh, an investigator called me. I don't recall who it was. They asked me basically the same information that I'm answering today. And uh, that was it. And that was a couple of years ago. And then just recently, maybe within the month, I was again contacted by an investigator for the defense. When is the first time that you saw Exhibit uh, 360 after the day that you filled the uh, form out? Uh, that would be my driver's log. When was the first time I yes. saw it? Uh, that would have to be maybe a week ago. Now, is it your testimony that uh, you are testifying from your present recollection that you went to Delta Airlines? Or are you taking a look at 360 and looking at the original destination? No, I'm, I, I know for a fact. When, when I was asked, before I even saw the driver's record to refresh my memory, when I was asked by the investigator, do you remember what terminal you brought him to, I was able to tell them right up front, automatically. How were you able to do that? Uh, well, for my own sake, this is something I didn't forget about too easily. You don't what, forget what things that? too easily when, when, when you're... Uh, looking at a situation like this. What situation is this? Uh, this trial. Now, you were contacted about, well, a couple of weeks ago, and you were asked about this particular drive. Correct. Correct. And you didn't really have to think about where you took uh, Eric Menendez in particular before that time, did you? No. And so after uh, four years, you remember specifically, independent of 360, where you took him? Yes, Mr. Koryama, that is correct. Wh why is it that that sticks out in your mind? Okay. Objection argument. Because, um, as I said, uh, Mr. Menendez expressed to me the fact that he had to get to the airport, and I made it my business to get him to the airport on time. And, and um, 
being that Mr. Valentine had told me at that point, Mr. Valentine had informed me that uh, Mr. Menendez had been the one to make a very unfortunate discovery. Uh, that is basically why I never forgot that day. Now, who told you about this? Uh, Mr. Valentine, the bodyguard, expressed to me that Mr. Menendez had found, was the one that had found, the, stumbled upon the murder scene. He stumbled upon the What I was told by Mr. Valentine specifically that Eric Menendez was the one that walked in his family's home and found the situation. So it appears that uh, Officer Valentine had some information from either Eric or his brother. Yeah, I don't know. Sustain the answer stricken. In any event, that's what was told to you? Correct. Now, do you remember on all of your uh, limo uh, service, services that you've performed, do you remember every stop that you've ever made in all of the drives? No, I could if remember were, a few. If you were to be taking somebody to the airport, for example, and that person wanted to stop and get a newspaper, would you note that on, on this sort of a, uh, a log that is Exhibit 360 to uh, note that a stop such as that had been made? Any stop whatsoever, Mr. Koriyama. Would I'd be made to, on this? I, yes, absolutely, because I have to account for my time, no matter how short or long. Now, wouldn't your time be accounted for in the overall drive? Well, sure, as, as, as pertaining to the billing, yes. As pertaining to the billing of the client, yes. Okay, and when you talk about your time, uh, you have to account for it. There is a, a section of, of Exhibit 360 that says time out, time in, and total time, correct? Correct. Now, the time out says 8 o'clock? Uh, 8 a.m., that would be correct. Time in is 3 o'clock? That's correct. Total time was seven hours on this particular uh, job? That is correct. That's what it states here, but that's not my handwriting. Whose handwriting is that, do you know? Uh, I couldn't tell you, maybe one of the dispatches or something. Now, whose handwriting is it that shows the miles? That would be my handwriting. Okay, where did you start this trip? Uh, I started at, uh, out of Princeton, New Jersey. Okay, and would that be indicated by the 76,024? No. That uh, particular mileage is specifically the miles from the hotel to the airport. And back? Uh, it might be back, I'm not sure. Well, the total time, the total mileage... Judging from, from the amount of mileage, I would say that that would be just the mileage uh, when Mr. Menendez was in the car. Is it your testimony? What is your testimony as to how far it is from the Sheraton Center to LaGuardia Airport? Uh, I have no testimony on that. Okay, what is it? Can you do you know what it is? Okay, uh, two, 32 miles. Now, are you just going off of this form? Yes. So you don't know, independent of this form, you don't know how far it is? No, of course not. You're not that familiar with the, uh, the uh, travel from the Sheraton to LaGuardia? Oh, I'm absolutely familiar with it, but I, I don't know the mileage and, from every point that I go to at it off the top of my head, no. Okay. Now, where it says uh, Sheraton Center to LaGuardia, you have down certain times. There's an arrival time at 9.30, correct? Correct. And an LV time, which is, that means leave time? Correct. At 10.50, correct? Correct. Did you place in this section the arrival time at LaGuardia? Yes. Is that your handwriting? It's very, unle very unlegible. I, Does I that appear to be your handwriting? Yes. Okay. And what does it say? To the naked eye, it looks like 11 a.m. Okay. But there's no way I would have made an entry for 11 a.m. because it doesn't take 10 minutes to make that trip. And me using the shortest direct route because of the fact that we were pressed for time, 
When you say you're pressed for time, did Eric Menendez indicate to you personally that he was pressed for time? Yes, he said that he had to make that flight because he had um, business and family meetings that had to be met that day in Los Angeles. Were you aware that three defense witnesses came in and testified that Eric Menendez came to L.A. from the East Coast on September 1st of Objection, 1989? Yeah. Objection. Were you aware of that? Sustained. Okay. Now, are you sure that this was August 31st? Whatever it says, Mr. Corriano. No, are you sure that it was August 31st? Yes, I'm sure it was August 31st. Now, when you left LaGuardia, what time did you leave LaGuardia? Uh, according to my trip sheet, I would have left LaGuardia at 12.30 p.m. Is that what that says? Yes, it does. And you arrived back at the Sheraton Center when? At 1 p.m. in the afternoon. So it took you half an hour to get back to the Sheraton Center from LaGuardia? Correct. Now, there's a note where it says remarks. It says wait and return to New York City. What does that mean? Uh, wait and return just uh, specifies that I had to wait for Mr. Menendez to whenever he came out and got in my car and then go to whatever the destination was and make a return trip from that destination to New York City. Were you told why you had to return to New York City? Uh, no, I wasn't. Not until I was at the airport. Now, on August 31st, uh, Mr. Delisio, since you have a good recollection of what occurred that day, Objection. what is it? Assisting. What is it? Question. What is it that you remember, in particular, that Eric Menendez said as a reason why he had to get back to Los Angeles? Objection. Asked and answered. Overall, uh, his specific answer was that he had business and family appointments that had to be met and that he needed to catch that flight because otherwise it would make him late for those, for those particular appointments. And you waited to make sure that uh, he was uh, safely secured on the airline that he took back to Los Angeles, Yes. Correct? Well, I, I waited in the terminal after I gave him his baggage. I made sure that he had gotten through smoothly and was on his way. I could only walk so far you know, to, up to the metal detectors or whatever. Okay. And once I saw that he was on his way, you know, because I was concerned for the gentleman. Okay. Well, this concern, did it extend beyond the ticket counter then? Uh, no. Okay. No. So once you go to the ticket counter and he checks in, you watch to make sure that he went through the, the metal detectors to the uh, gates? Correct. I dropped his baggage on the, uh, I don't recall if it was on the floor or on the scale for him. And I stayed sort of back with Officer Valentine. And once uh, I saw that uh, Mr. Menendez was on his way, we left. And your log indicates that you returned to the Sheraton Center Hotel at about 1 p.m., correct? Correct. I have nothing further, Your Honor. Any redirect? Just a couple of questions. Uh, Mr. Delisio, uh, how long did it take you to get to the airport from the Sheraton Center Hotel? From the airport to the Sheraton Center, uh, according to no. my trip sheet. From the Sheraton Center. I'm sorry. To the airport. Uh, that would be approximately 40 minutes. Okay, and you said it took you about a half an hour to return Correct. from the airport to the hotel. Correct. Okay, what? Why is that? could be any of a number of reasons. Okay, is there a difference in traffic patterns going uh, to uh, LaGuardia Airport than there is on the return back? Well, uh, possibly. Well, that extra 10 minutes could have been the time it took from when I got into the airport and uh, they had flights that were scheduled to depart or arrive and maybe traffic in the airport caused me to take a few extra minutes to get up to the door of the terminal. Okay. Um, you are, your testimony is that you uh, took Eric Menendez to the Delta Terminal, is correct. that correct? You're not uh, in any way unsure of that? No, I'm it, positive that I took him to Delta. You didn't take him to U.S. Air? No. <coughs> Thank you. I have nothing to prove. Anything else? Yes. Yes.
Mr. Delisio, did you just testify that it took you 40 minutes to get to the Sheraton, from the Sheraton Center to LaGuardia? Approximately. Okay, now, so that would bring you to 1130 to get to LaGuardia. <coughs> Without looking at the Exhibit 360, sir. Well, what do you mean with that? Okay, approximately 11:30. Okay, so that's when you uh, arrived at Laguardia. Okay, thank you. Nothing further. All right, thank you. You may step down. You're excused. With their attorneys, the people are represented, and we have both jury panels in court. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. Good morning. And as to the uh, gold jury, we've uh, substituted uh, an alternate juror for one of the jurors on that jury panel who was um, uh, unable to continue on as a juror and uh, due to physical situation. She's uh, giving birth to a child and couldn't obviously be here. So we're... We have substituted uh, for that juror, and also another alternate juror on that gold jury has been ill for a couple of days, and she has been excused. And we're now ready to proceed with the uh, trial with both juries present. Uh, people have further evidence to offer? Briefly. Okay. <coughs> no. And would you say your name again for the record? Leslie H. Zoller. I'll remind you, you're still under oath. Yes, Your Honor. Your Honor, I have your photograph. May it be marked as exhibit 397, please? Yes. May I approach, please? Yes. Detective Zoller, I'm showing you exhibit 397. Could you describe briefly what this is? It's a photograph of uh, 722 North Elm, Eric Menendez's uh, bedroom. And it shows the, from inside the room, showing a desk, uh, a, uh, a dresser with drawers open, and an open door. And is that approximately the condition of the room when you were at the home between the 20th and 21st of August of 1989? Yes. Thank you. Detective Zoller, on the... On the 24th of May of 1993, did a man named Ed Fenno come into the Beverly Hills Police Department for an interview? Yes, he did. During that cor the course of that interview, was Mr. Fenno asked particular questions and did he give answers? Yes. And at one point, did he discuss um, an incident occur uh, involving um, Eric Menendez and Ber Berkeley, UC Berkeley? Yes. And could you tell us what Mr. Fenno told you uh, during that interview in my, my presence and Mr. Kariyama's presence? He was asked if, uh, to his knowledge, whether Eric was looking forward to going to UCLA. And his reply was yes. He uh, was really looking forward to going to UCLA because they had a great tennis team. And then he added that uh, Mr. Menendez, Jose Menendez, the father, was upset with Eric because uh, Eric <coughs> turned down or decided not to go to Berkeley. After he made the statement about the fact that Eric Menendez had turned down Berkeley, was he asked about that again by either myself or Mr. Kuriyama? Yes. And did he reply in the same manner? Yes, he restated the same statement. And lastly, uh, have you viewed the videotapes made by Ms. Erdely, the defense investigator, um, dealing with um, the par portions which deal with Century City? Yes. And have you since then gone by Century City to see if you can locate the area which she described in her testimony as a taxi zone? Yes. And is there, in fact, a taxi zone in the area that she identified as such? Uh, I Overall. Yes, I did. And what did you find? It was a, uh, the area where she went that she described, I think, as a taxi zone. It was uh, red curbed and with the placards stating valet. Is there valet parking available at Century Plaza? Yes. And are, are the curbs surrounding the shopping center? Where, where are you talking about? You said I'm sorry. Century Plaza? I said, I, I'm sorry. Century City Shopping Center. Are the That's curbs. correct. And um, did you see anything else around there that resembled a taxi zone? No. I have nothing further at this witness at this time. <coughs> Cross-examination? Uh, just briefly. Can I remain seated, John? Yes. Uh, the valet parking area at the Century City Shopping uh, 
mall. Isn't there a staircase that leads directly up from the valet parking area um, and in a straight line to the ticket booths of the AMC theaters? Yes. And it's there is a, a long stretch, a fairly long stretch of red curb, is there not, uh, before the place where the valets themselves actually stand? That's correct. And the area where the staircase is is not the area where the valets stand, isn't that true? It's actually in between the long section of red curb and where the, the valet stands. Exactly. Um, now, the photograph you just identified as being of Eric Menendez's bedroom. What number did you get? 397. 397. I'm just going to hold it up to you from here. Is it still your testimony, Detective Zoller, that there are no <coughs> windows in that bedroom that overlook the pool area and look onto the guest house? No, it is not. Okay, so there are at least two windows in that bedroom that look out over the pool area, the tennis court area, and towards the guest house. Are That's correct. Thank you. Okay. I'll just see if there's anything else. Nor do I. Uh, on this aspect, we're going to. Yes. Uh, anything else on behalf of Lyle and Edis? <coughs> All right, thank you. You're going to step down? Thank you. Nice. All right. with council. Um, council, will you stipulate that exhibit 394 is a true and correct copy of the movie listings for the AMC Century 14 theaters as published in the Los Angeles Times for Sunday, August the 20th, 1989? Will you further stipulate that the movie Batman has a running time of 126 minutes and that the movie License to Kill has a running time of 123, excuse me, 133 minutes. We also stipulate that the Big Five sporting goods chain shipped all of its handguns out of the Santa Monica store referred to in the testimony by March of 1986 and that the chain stopped selling handguns in all of its Southern California stores by November of 1986. Will you further stipulate that the play Hurley Burley was shown at the Westwood Playhouse between November the 9th of 1988 and January the 15th of 1989? And lastly, will you stipulate that the television movie, The Billionaire Boys Club, aired on national television on July 30th and 31st, 1989, and was shown in Los Angeles, California, and Tampa, Florida? It was aired from 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. on those two nights. Do counsel so stipulate? <coughs> Thank you. Your Honor, this time then, subject to um, the evidence that people would rest their rebuttal case. All right. Um, people rest. Uh, any sir rebuttal? Yes, Your Honor. All right. You may proceed. We, we call uh, Ann Ingram. Does someone get her? <laughs> If you would stand right where you are and face the court clerk, please, raise your right hand. We do solemnly swear that the testimony you may give in the cause now pending before this court shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth from all God. Please take your stand and state your name for the record. <coughs> Uh, my name is Ann Ingram. A N N I N G R A H A M. Your Honor, at this time I have a uh, piece of paper, actually, with some other paper stapled over it, but I'd like to mark this as next in order 398. All right. I would ask uh, counsel for people if they would stipulate that this uh, piece of paper contains on it the three names that the witness Grant Walker wrote, uh, indicating uh, the people whose pool he serviced on Saturday, uh, August 19, 1989. <coughs> yes. Uh, Mrs. Ingram, do you know Grant Walker? 
Yes, I do. And uh, does he service your swimming pool? Yes, he does. And uh, does he currently come on Saturdays? Yes, he does. When did he start working uh, for you? In Ma late March or early April of 91. 1991, that's, that's correct. correct. And Mrs. Ingram, um, do you live on Lucerne? Yes, I do. Do you live in the 400 North Block of Lucerne? Uh, no, I don't. I have nothing further, Your Honor. Examination on behalf of the co-defendant. <coughs> Cross. Yes, briefly. May I stay seated? Yes. Mrs. Ingram, what is the name of the person who referred Mr. Walker to you? Mary Ann McCole. And where does she live, please? Could the witness write the address rather than... Well, no, just tell me the street. Do you know the street that she lives on? Now, presently? No, at the time that you got the at referral. At the time that she made the referral, she lived on 2nd and Van Ness. And is that in the Hancock Park area? I don't know the precise boundaries of what is considered Hancock Park area, but it's in the neighborhood. It's, a, it's east of Hancock Park, is that yes, correct? Yes, it's east of Hancock Park. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Anything else? No, Your Honor. All right, thank you. May you step down. You're excused. Thank you. <laughs> and your next witness. Our next witness, Your Honor, is uh, Virginia Valdry. <laughs> You would stand behind the court reporter and face the court clerk and raise your right hand, please. You do solemnly swear that the testimony you may give in a cause not pending before this court shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Just take the stand and state the name of the record. My name is Virginia Valdry. I reside at. V as in Victor, A-L-D-R-Y, Valdry. Mrs. Valdry, uh, did you live um, in the 500 South Block of Lucerne in 1989? Yes, I did. Uh, have you ever lived in the 400 North Block of Lucerne? No, I haven't. Uh, Mrs. Valdry, in 1989 and up to the present, did a man named Grant Walker uh, work for you in servicing your pool? Uh, 87 to the present. And. Does he currently service your pool on Saturdays? Yes, he does. And when did he start servicing your pool on Saturdays? Uh, as far as I could remember, he's been serving it on Saturdays. Uh, when he started, he started midweek to get the pool chemical and everything balanced, but I don't remember how long he did that. Do you recall telling Ms. Erdely, our investigator, on Tuesday, uh, last Tuesday, that the fall of 1990 would be the earliest that he started on Saturdays. I told her approximately, but I didn't really remember, being that it's been that long. I, and I don't log that. Did you also tell Ms. Erdley that it's been two and a half or three years that he's been coming on Saturdays? I told her up until, like I said, I, I really didn't keep a record, so I don't know when he actually started, but the period that he did service my pool on midweek was just a short period of time. So now you're saying that you didn't tell Miss Erdely that he came, that he was servicing your pool midweek up until two and a half or three years. I told her I didn't really remember it. Okay, so you're saying you didn't tell her two and a half or three years. Mm -hmm. I don't remember what I told And you didn't tell her the fall of 1990, is that what you're saying? No, I didn't, no. All right, I have nothing further. Any examination by the code of penalty? I'll just bring it up. Cross-examination? Yes. Mrs. Valdry, um, do you remember approximately when in 1987 Mr. Walker began to clean your pool? Uh, it was in the... <coughs> Summer, probably was June. And does he still clean your pool? Yes, he does. 
presently when he cleans your pool, does he come on Saturdays? On Saturdays. I believe you indicated that when he first started cleaning your pool, he had to do something to it to get the chemicals correct? Uh, I had my pool resurfaced, and the, the people that resurfaced it and tiled it gave me Mr. Walker's name because he was uh, good at getting the chemicals started. All right, the objections overrule the answer will stay. Okay. Uh, my next question then is, so for a period of time, he had to do something because your pool had been redone, is that correct? Yes. And do you remember approximately how long it was that Mr. Walker had to make these adjustments to your pool before he started just to service it regularly? I think it was about three weeks. Okay. And after that time, did he begin to come on Saturdays? Yes, he did. Okay. Now, did you, do you keep any kind of records to show when Mr. Walker shows up at your house? No, I don't. Okay. Is it your best recollection that Mr. Walker, aside from this initial period of time, has always come to your house on Saturdays? As far as I remember. Okay. And have you referred Mr. Walker to any of your neighbors? No, I haven't. Do you know if Mr. Walker services any of your neighbors from 19, any of your neighbors in 1989? No, I don't. Okay, thank you. I have nothing further. Anything else? No, I don't. All right, thank you. You may step down. You're excused. Your next witness. Yeah. Call Mark Slotkin, Your Honor. Step forward and uh, stand behind this uh, court, the court reporter right here and face the court clerk, please. Can you solemnly swear that the testimony you may give in the cause operating before this court shall be the truth, the whole truth, and that we will not so help you die? I do. It's Mark, M A R K, Slot, F L O T K I N. Mr. Slotkin, behind you is a, a diagram, which is exhibit number six of 722 North Elm Drive. Do you see that diagram? Yes. Are you familiar with the location of 722 North Elm uh, yes. Drive? Yes. Could you tell me how you're familiar with that location? I built the house. And when did you build the house? It was completed about 1984. And did you uh, live in the house yourself? Yes. During what period of time? From 1984 until uh, its sale. And when was it sold? Um, 1988. I had rented it a few times, but basically I lived there. Right. And who did you sell a home to in 88? To the Menendez family. And who did you deal with, if anyone, in the Menendez family regarding the sale? Well, mostly the broker was in between, but I did have a chance to meet the Menendezes and uh, I dealt a little with them. All right. And did you have much contact at all with Mr. and Mrs. Menendez? More with Mrs. than with, 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 than with Mr. And when you were um, living at the house, um, did you have some changes done within the home itself? Structural changes? Overall, you can answer the question. Well, I built the house, so it was for, I built it from scratch, so it wouldn't right. be a change to me. Do you recognize... Um, the floor plan that's depicted in that diagram, exhibit number six? Yes. Is that uh, accurate insofar as the location of the stairs and other rooms is? No. What is inaccurate about the diagram? The, um, the stairway, should I, should I point? Yes, if, and if you want to step down there, feel free to do that. The, the stairway. This one here. Um, was never built. That's it. That's incorrect. All right. That stairway was was the, actually the original stairs in the house, and we, we we elected to take them out, and we we expanded the library, became bigger, and it abutted the dining room. And the uh, the other problem is is that uh, in the maids area and the service area, there are no closets shown there. When you say the problem, you mean the problem with the diagram. Yes, they're, they're, they exist, and the diagram doesn't show them. All right. Now, the location of the maid's bedroom is in uh, correct location there? Yes. And could I approach you with this? Yes. You see on the <coughs> right-hand side of the diagram, there appears to be some sort of a window or a door drawn in there? Yes. 
And is, is that true? There's a window there that faces out? Yes. And on the bottom of the diagram, um, it says maid's bed, bathroom, and there's a door which leads out. Is that accurate? Yeah. Accurately depicted on the diagram? Yes. Um, could you tell us what the construction of that house was like in terms of soundproofing? Well, the whole house had interior insulation and exterior insulation in it, soundproofing, and it had, in most of the rooms, two by six studs. The walls were a little thicker. How about in the maid's room? <clears throat> my, my recollection that there were two by six studs for, for, for structural value, but I, I, I couldn't uh, swear to whether they were two by four or two by six. I have a series of photographs I'd like to mark this. Next 399 is the next exhibit number. Six foot. Could those be marked collectively? Are you going to refer to them individually? or? Yes. Okay. All right, just mark their how many? Six. Right. Use uh, letter designations 399A, et cetera. Can, uh, could I approach a witness? Yes. Your Honor? Thank you. You said the diagram was inaccurate and not depicting a closet area in the maid's room. Could you, with this marker, draw in where the closet would be on the diagram itself? And in the uh, family room, in the uh, wall that adjoins the maid's room, is there something <laughs> against that wall? <laughs> yes. And is that a, a bookshelf that lines that entire wall? Um, yes, I didn't. I didn't build the bookcase in, but the but the bookcase was built um, after they purchased it. And did you go into the house after the Menendez uh, parents purchased the home? Yes. Did you go into the family room at some point? Yes. And did you see the built-in uh, bookcase along that wall where you've written in bookcase on the diagram? Yes. Showing you exhibit 399A. Can you tell me uh, if you know what's depicted in that photograph? Excuse me. May I present? <clears throat> this is the um, the maid's room. All right, and in that photograph is the maid's bed depicted on the right. Yes. And on the left, um, there are two adjoining, what appears to be two adjoining doors. Are those doors which lead into the? closet in the maid's room which you've drawn on the diagram exhibit six yes and that's an actual closet it's not a fake door that leads nowhere correct? no it's a bifold closet that holds clothes and how it makes it, it's a bi bifold closet and how wide is the closet approximately <coughs> um well my my recollection was that it went the length of the room but from that photograph it looks like it was a little narrower but i, I believe that the head that, that you could that you could open the closet and reach around, and so there would still be an ex. There's still be on the in the maids area an area for them to sit, but the closet went around a little bit. That was my recollection, but it looks like it's about eight feet wide. And showing you 399B, can you tell me what's depicted in that photograph? That is uh, the game room, with the rough cedar paneling in it, and the bar, and the um, the bookcase that the Menendez is built in. The bookcase is drawn in on Exhibit 6, correct? Yes. And 399C, if you could tell me what's depicted in that photograph. That is the maid's room uh, with the window that led out to uh, the outside. All right. And looking at the diagram, is that the window that is depicted on the right side of the maid's 
made you? Right, right there, yes. Right, you're pointing to the right side of the diagram where a window is right. running. Right, right. And 399B, can you tell me what that depicts? That is the uh, maid's, um, part of the maid's bathroom area that led to uh, an exterior door to the backyard. And on the diagram that's depicted in here at the bottom. That's correct. Showing the door leading out toward the bottom of the diagram. Right. And 399E, can you tell me um, what's depicted in that diagram with reference to where the maid's window would be? <clears throat> the maid's window would be uh, toward the um, <coughs> left center of the uh, tennis court fence. Could you take marker and just put on the photograph where the maid's window would be uh, depicted in there. Well, the maid's window wouldn't show because it's, it's, it's lower than the fence, but it would be the, uh, where the arrow would point to. You're drawing an arrow on the photograph indicating that the window is next to a fence which separates the house from the tennis court. That's right. And exhibit 399F, is that another photograph showing? Yes, that's the window. That's the, that's depicts the maid's window, as well as the laundry room door. Could you again draw in the diagram where the maid's window would be? And you've done that. And the uh, shrubbery on the left in that photograph would be the shrubbed wall that separates her window from the tennis court. Correct. Yes. Now, are you familiar with where Eric Menendez slept in the house after the Menendez family moved in? Yes. And where is Eric Menendez's room in reference to the maid's room? Um, the the window the, the window actually isn't showing here, but it would be on the second story, and it would be above the living room. But it would be on a second story up. Right. And based on um, your knowledge of that house and having lived there, do you have an opinion as to whether or not if someone was pounding on the door of Eric's bedroom, you could hear that noise down in the maid's uh, bedroom? Did you spend some time in the maid's uh, room when you lived there? Were there times when you went into that room? Yes. Could you, uh, standing in that room, hear noises that were taking place in other parts of the house? Objection assumes facts not in evidence. You're asking just when he was there, did you hear sounds in other parts? Of the yeah. House? Um, I, I think that you could hear something in the laundry room and certainly something in the, in the breakfast room. Which we've been hearing here. That's not the question. It's all of you when you were in the maid room. Were you able to hear sounds coming from other Yes. And could you hear, for instance, if someone made a loud sound in the area where Eric Menendez, uh, where his bedroom is, could you hear it in the maid's room? A loud sound? Yes. Such as pounding on a door or something like I that. I don't think you could hear that. Yeah, I move to strike as in proper opinion. Did you ever, when you were in the maid's room, uh, were you ever, during the time that you lived in the house, able to hear loud sounds emanating from the room which became Eric Menendez's room? Objection assumes facts not in evidence. Such sounds existed. Can you sustain this question? Did you ever, during the period of time that you lived in the house, when you were in the maid's room, hear loud noises emanating from anywhere uh, in the house? Objection assumes facts not in evidence. We never heard, uh, no. And in your opinion, was the maid's room uh, soundproof enough so that it, it was not a situation where the walls were thin and you could hear throughout the house? Objection, a lack of foundation and proper opinion. Could you hear, when you were in the maid's bedroom, a uh, conversation taking place in the family room? No. And could you, when you were in the maid's room, hear a conversation taking place in the, do you know what the foyer area of the house means, where that is? You're pointing to in the diagram. Could is that, you? Is that the foyer? Yes. You couldn't hear anything. 
could you hear conversation, people talking in the foyer area? If you were in the major room, could you hear it? Objection, lack of foundation. Well, when you were in the house, were there times when you would be in the maids' room and there were other people in the house in other rooms? I can't say. I'm sure that I was in the maids' room occasionally or in the laundry room and there were other people in the house. And did you, during those periods of time, could you hear a conversation taking place in other rooms in the house? Objection no. assumes facts not in evidence. Sustain. You can ask the question. What was your answer? What was the question again? Okay. <laughs> your Honor, I thought it was thought sustained. It was sustained. You, you said sustained. No, I said go, go ahead, ask the question. You can answer it. Okay. Tell me the question again, yes. please. Were there ever periods of time when you were in the maids' room while other people were in the house where your attention was attracted to conversation that was taking place? No, uh, that was that was not the case. You couldn't you couldn't hear into the other rooms from the maids' room. Now, after, um, are you familiar with the date that the Menendez parents were killed? August of 1989. And after the killings, did you go to the Menendez home shortly thereafter? Yes. Do you know when that was in relation to when the killings had taken place? My recollection, it was the day or so afterwards. And did you, on that occasion, when you went to the home, uh, meet Eric or Lyle Menendez? Yes. And was that the first time you had met them? Yes. And what was the purpose of meeting them at that time? Um, the, the house was on the way to work for me, and I wanted to stop by and um, uh, express my condolences. And did you, in fact, do that? Yes. What did you say to either or both of them at that time during that conversation? Objection hearsay. Is it offered for the truth of no, the matter, sir? No, it's for the non-hearsay purpose of showing what was said after he made the statement. Objection overall. Uh, I introduced myself. They were in the. I drove into the driveway, and they um, they were in the courtyard, the driveway courtyard, with some security people. And I walked up and introduced myself and told them how sorry I was, and if there was anything that I could do for them. You know, in the future, to please call on me that I, you know, I could be a friend, and I was a friend of their family, and I'd like to you know, continue on if uh, if it's something I could do for them. And when you expressed uh, your condolences, how did uh, Eric and Lyle uh, Menendez appear? First of all, Lyle Menendez, how did he appear? Was he happy, sad? How would you characterize his demeanor when you had this conversation? He was very sad. And how about Eric Menendez? Grief stricken. Now, when you um, expressed to them that you were available, uh, should they feel the need, did they, in fact, contact you at some later time? <clears throat> yes. And did you indicate, um, other than saying if you, if you needed a friend, uh, anything else that you were available to do? Well, I said if they needed some you know, fatherly advice or you know, business advice, I, I felt that I was a, you know, an, an astute businessman in Los Angeles and could you know, make sure that they you know, went on the right path if they needed some help. And at some point after you had that conversation, did they, did either or both of them uh, contact you and make an appointment to come and see you? Yes. When was that? About two weeks afterwards, they called. Two weeks after the first conversation? Yes. And did they call to make an appointment with you? Yes. And did they, in fact, keep that appointment? Yes. And did you give them certain advice at that time? We spoke for a couple of hours, and we, you know, we I, I offered them some suggestions. Were they seeking your uh, counsel or advice on anything? I think so. What were they asking? <clears throat> they were asking what direction I thought their lives should go in, you know, after this tragedy. And am I correct in saying that this is the second conversation that you had had with them? Yes. And they the, were the third conversation. When was the the third? phone call to make the appointment, <coughs> the initial meeting, and then the conversation? And they were asking you for what direction their life should take at that point. Yes. And what advice, if any, did you give them? Objection, irrelevant, and hearsay. Overall, um, I had understood, you know, when they when when with my dealings with Kitty Menendez that okay, that's non-responsive. Uh, well, what advice, if any, did you give them? 
I advise them to become professional tennis players. And did you indicate why they should do that as opposed to some other uh, occupation? Well, this advice was based on the fact that they told me that they were um, of uh, world class, they had world class ability, and uh, I told them that they should exploit that, that ability. And was there some uh, concern expressed by either or both brothers as to whether um, they should stay in school or go to school? Yes. And what was said in that regard? Lyle was pretty much out of school from Princeton, and Eric was talking about enrolling at UCLA. And I had, had advised them that um, they uh, that Eric could you know take two courses. He could either he should he could, she should enter UCLA and and uh, enter their, te their tennis program, and he could play in the NC2A tennis tournaments, and that, uh, that uh, both of them should you know, get a professional coach to, to help develop their abilities and give them a discipline regimen. And did you advise them in terms of whether it was a good idea to go to school as opposed to uh, follow this uh, career as tennis players? Well, in Lyle's, in Lyle's uh, situation, he was not going to go back to school and he definitely wanted to go into the tennis thing and Eric was vacillating between going and playing tennis and going to school or just solely doing tennis and I told him he could do both if he was able to get into UCLA but that he, they should keep the coach or they should hire a coach. And did either or both brothers uh, also seek your advice on other investments, business investments? At, at we, that time? Yes. First of all, Lyle Menendez, what uh, information or advice did he seek from you? Lyle needed a car his car was falling apart. He said he needed a car, so we no, discussed. I would object to this. All right. Do uh, you object to this answer that's been given, or are you objecting to no, any further? No, I object further? to any further questioning. Along okay. Let me ask you if I could ask another question. All right. And how about Eric Menendez? Did you discuss with him? <coughs> yes. And what discussion did you have with Eric Menendez? Eric um, needed transportation also. So we discussed what kind of car we ought to buy, you know, and we, we decided on a Jeep, an open-air Jeep, and we discussed uh, their, you know, where they ought to live and um, that sort of thing. Right. And after that meeting with them, did they continue to seek your advice and counsel? Well, we became more friendly, and it, 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 it wasn't so much for advice as counsel as it was that we were friends, and occasionally these things would come up, and they'd ask me what I thought, and I'd told him so. Thank you. I believe that's all I have. Any examination on behalf of Eric? <clears throat> yeah, just very briefly. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Slotkin, apart from having been the person who built this house, you do have a very large and active business in Los Angeles, do you now? Yes. Are you comfortable telling us what it is? <clears throat> yes. Okay. Tell us what you do. Objection relevance. Overall. I'm in the antique business. Are you, in fact, the owner of a company called Antiquarian Traders? Yes. Um, and uh, in your contacts with um, Mrs. Menendez, apart from selling the house, did you also try to advise her or guide her in uh, purchasing uh, furnishings for that house? Objection, relevance. Sustained. <clears throat> I take it you had never met either Lyle or Eric Menendez until after their parents died. Is that That's correct? right. Now, with respect, you, you called the family room the game room. Is that what you called it when you built the house? Yes. Okay, but that is the same room, the one with the bookcases. Yes. And um, was it your experience when you lived in that house that you could uh, play a television set in that room without it causing a disturbance to any of the people if there were people in the surrounding rooms? Yes. And was it uh, your experience when you lived in the house that the maid's room also had a television that could be played without disturbing anybody in the family room? Your Honor, assumes facts, not in evidence, like a foundation. Rephrase the question. When you lived in the house, was there a television in the maid's room? Objection, relevance. Overall. Yes. Did someone use that television from time to time in the maid's room? Yes. Were you um, at times when someone was watching television in the maid's room in the family room? Yes. Could you hear the maid's room TV? No. Was it your purpose when you built this house uh, to make it a house where there would not be disturbing noises going from one area of the house to the other? Yes. 
that, that room more purposely than others because it, it abutted the kitchen and the laundry room. So there was extra protection for that. Which one are you talking about? I'm talking about the game room, so family you, room, and the bar area. So you made that one extra soundproof because it would be close to working areas of the house. Yes, it had a layer of one inch in addition to the normal insulation and drywall on both sides. It had a layer of one inch uh, rough cedar on it that would have made it, you know, that much harder to hear through. And adding the bookcases that made it even harder <coughs> still, did it not? Um, I can only speculate to that because I didn't hear it after the bookcases were in, but it would seem to me that would be the Your case. Honor, move to strike. It would seem to me as being speculation on the part of the witness. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> Mr. Slotkin, when you did visit the house after the Menendezes moved in, did you see that the bookcase was in fact full of books? Yes. And trophies, is that correct? I don't remember the trophies. <coughs> I have nothing further on. Mr. Slotkin, when did you purchase the property at 722 North Elm? About 1982. And when you purchased the property, was there a house on it? Yes. Did you tear the house down completely? Uh, except for a small portion of the basement, yes. All right, so Exhibit 6 that's on the board that you've made reference to, does that appear to be similar to the blueprints that you submitted to the city of Beverly Hills when you built your house? Uh, except for the stairway, pretty similar, yes. All right, and this particular blueprint, may I approach Mr. Honor? Yes. Uh, this particular exhibit, number six, um, would it be fair to say then that the house that existed on the property before you built the house did not have a staircase in this particular area here? The, there was a staircase that went down to the basement. In this area? Somewhere in that area, to my recollection, but there was also a staircase that, and that's the one I'm thinking that this one is, there was a staircase that was in the original blueprints that went up to the second floor, and that was taken out. And right. that, that's, what I'm, that's what I'm referring to. Okay, so the original blueprints that you submitted to the city of Beverly Hills to construct this property contained a staircase in this area next to what we call either the den or the study. To go upstairs? Yes. Yes. Okay. That was taken out. Well, I'm going to object, John. I think the question's vague as to which original <coughs> blueprints are being referred to of the earlier house or of the house he was building? I, I, I indicated the original blueprints that you submitted to the city of Beverly Hills when you built your property after tearing down the other house, did they contain a staircase going up in the area that's depicted on diagram six that you've said you never built? Yes. Okay. Now, I believe you've indicated that um, you spent some time in the maid's room, is that correct? Yes. Did you ever spend the night in the maid's room? Well, no. okay, now, I'm going to have to, I'm going <laughs> to, I'm going to ask you some questions because I'm going to ask you some questions about noise in the house, and I'm not trying to pry Mr. Slotkin, but did you ever conduct any noise test? In other words, did you ever go stay in the maid's room to see if you could hear noise coming from other parts of the house? No, I didn't conduct such a test. All right, and um, were you ever aware of other? Were you ever aware of whether or not other people were having <coughs> screaming fights in your house, and you were in another part of the house, and you could either hear them or not hear them? Um, we didn't have screaming fights in our house, so I can't. That, I would say I was not aware of that. All right, so you don't know how the noise traveled in your house <coughs> if somebody was having some sort of screaming fight. Would that be fair to say? Not about a fight, but about other things. You could you could hear televisions or not hear them, and you could hear pounding. You know, like if you were hammering something and putting up a picture frame or something. You know, you could. You know, we were we were in we were in construction. I was familiar with okay. with the two rooms. Yeah. Yes, but if if you couldn't hear something occur, how did you know it occurred? And otherwise, in other words, if someone was up in another room of the house, let's say someone was in Eric Menendez's bedroom and you were in the maid's bathroom. You wouldn't know if someone was conducting certain activities in another bedroom unless you saw it, right? Objection argumentative. Do you, under do you understand my question? Yeah, if I didn't hear, you're saying if I didn't actually hear the fight going on, then I wouldn't be able to have make an assessment of whether 
whether there was whether I could hear it or I couldn't hear it. Right. It? The only thing that I based that on was that when I when when I lived in the house and I had guests or if somebody stayed in Eric's bedroom, you couldn't you had to yell at the top of your lungs from downstairs to upstairs to to get some attention. And you know if you know. Hey, come on down unless you use the intercom system. Okay, but were you ever able to yell upstairs and get someone to come downstairs without using the intercom? Not from the maid's room, no. Well, how about from the foyer? Yeah, you could get somebody to come from the foyer down there. They might hear you. Now, did you ever go into the guest house and conduct any sound tests to see what you could hear from the guest house <coughs> from the inside of your the main house? Excuse me, I think the question's a little confusing. Do you understand? Did yes. You, okay. Did you ever do that? Did you ever go in the guest house to see what you could hear coming from the main house? The, the guest house back by the pool, right? Yes. You could. Uh, did I conduct sound tests from the from the guest house to the main house? Correct. No, I did not conduct sound tests. Okay. And you built the guest house at the same time that you built the main house. Yes. Okay. I believe you indicated that um, shortly after you learned that Mr. and Mrs. Menendez had died, um, that you went by the property and made your first contact with Eric and Lyle Menendez. Is that correct? Yes. Do you remember which day it was? Was it the day that you learned that they had died or the next day? <coughs> it was within two or three days maximum of the time of the, uh, the killings. All right, so it was your understanding that the killings had occurred on a Sunday and you had been, and you went by within two or three days of that Sunday, is that yes. correct? Yes. I believe you indicated that um, at that first meeting of the two defendants, that you indicated that you would give them, or you were, that you had some ability to give them business advice, is that correct? Well, it wasn't that, you know, I didn't use the word business advice. I, I, it was, you know, it was not the appropriate time. I just said if they needed any help, with anything, I'd like to try to help them. Right, and in your mind, did that include giving them business advice if they so desired? Probably so, yes. And at any time in any conversations that you had with them after this first meeting, did you ever give them any business advice? I think so. And what kind of business advice did you give them aside from what you've told us about the automobiles? Well, we talked about the tennis. That they, I thought they should make a business out of that. And, um, there were some discussions about an, uh, an investment that Lyle wanted to make back east that I advised them about. And was that, what kind of investment was Did that? I object, Your Honor. <clears throat> All right, when you indicate that Lyle Menendez asked you about some um, investment back east, was that business advice? Yes. Objection, Your Honor. Oh, sorry. Yes. Did you ever give Eric Menendez any business advice that was particular to his concerns? Yes. And what kind of business advice did you give him? Excuse me, Honor, I believe this was done in front of both juries. What kind of business advice did you give Eric Menendez? Aside from be becoming a tennis player? Yes. Um, Eric uh, wanted to, um, this is later on, several months later, Eric was- I would object, Your Honor. Irrelevance about several months later. Eric was thinking about or had actually given some money to a friend of his, of his to put on some sort of a, a concert. Erna, I'd like to approach. Mr. Slotkin, did Eric Menendez make any inquiry of you about investing money in a uh, concert? You can answer that yes or no. Yes. And did either Eric Menendez or his brother Lyle Menendez any make any, ever make any um, inquiry of you about whether they should invest in real estate? Was that ever discussed? No, we didn't discuss real estate. Did either of the defendants ever indicate to you where they were going to acquire the money to pay for their ventures? I'm going to object to the form of the question. I don't know what ventures she has in mind. All right, watch we'll to rephrase the question. Did either of the defendants ever indicate to you where they were going to get the money um, to fulfill their business aspirations? Same objection, Your Honor. All right, overall. Yes. And where did they tell you the money was coming from? Well, I'm going to object also to the form of the questions to who is speaking. Sustain. Do you have a specific recollection of discussing the source of funds with either Eric Menendez or Lyle Menendez? You can answer that yes or no. 
Bo I thought it was both of them. Okay, did you have, dis when you had your discussions with them, which concerned business affairs, was it always with both of them? Pretty much so. Okay, and what did both of them indicate to you as the source of the funds that they would be using? We have the foundation as the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you could specify when it was. All right, um, Mr. Slacken, how many times did you meet with the defendants after the first time when you went by the house, where you spoke about things like money or business? Maybe three, three to five times, but it wasn't only primarily business, but that's when I can remember that they, that, that ended into it. All right, and when you had these three to five meetings with the defendants where that particular subject might have been brought up, where did these meetings occur? Sometimes at my office and more often at my house. And when you say your house, you mean something other than 722 North Elm, correct? Yes. And um, do you recall at one of these particular meetings that you became aware of where the source of funds was for these particular <coughs> ventures? Um, there was some mention about a source of funds, yes. And do you remember what month that was that that, <clears throat> that you heard that mention? I, I think it was maybe within the first two months. Okay, and what were you told as to where the money was coming from? There were several sources that they had mentioned. Okay, could you tell me what they were, please? The first was from uh, a insurance policy. Um, and the second was from uh, Coralco. And what did you understand Coralco to be from the defendants? The employer of uh, Mr. Menendez. And what kind of monies um, <clears throat> were you told were going to be coming from Coralco? What kind of monies? Yeah, well, like how much? Are we yeah. Were you given an amount? Um, somewhere enough four or five million dollars to buy the house for the for the boys. All right, so it was your understanding that, that from Carolco they would be receiving approximately four to five million dollars? Well, that's what the boys told me. I, I didn't know if that was a fact or not. Right, I'm just asking In fact, you, I disputed that with them. Okay, but you, you, in fact, they told you that they believed that there would be approximately four or five million dollars coming from the employer of Mr. Menendez. Well, that... Is may, that what I told? may I amplify, or you just want a yes or no? Well, okay, you can amplify. Um, they thought that Coralco, who had a key man insurance policy that they didn't even know about at the time, but discovered later on, was going to be that Coralco was going to turn over part of the proceeds of that key man insurance policy to the boys. That's what they thought. Okay, so they had indicated to you that they did, prior to the deaths of their parents, they didn't know about the key man policy. Is that correct? Yes. I don't, I don't believe they had knowledge of that. Okay, and you specifically recall that, is that correct? Um, well, I didn't talk to them before the parents' the parents death, so I don't I, I that's my is that you your know, very, very, very strong impression that they did not have knowledge of that before the parents, before the parents died. Right, and so it was your understanding then that there would be some monies coming from Corolco, which were the result of a key man insurance policy. It was the boys' understanding, and they led me to believe that. All right, and was it so? You think this, the first time you were apprised of this particular policy, was it within two months of your first meeting with them in the driveway of the home? Is that correct? Approximately. All right. Now, um, did you get, ha, did they have any further discussion with you about any other sources of money they expected to get aside from the insurance policy and the money from Corolco? Well, that, that was an ongoing impression that they had uh, about the Corolco thing that lasted for a lot longer after they after they discovered. They thought they always thought that Corolco was going to come to their aid through, their aid through this insurance policy. There were some other. There was another insurance policy for considerably less money that, that I think was funded to them. And when you say you think it was funded to them, is that because of something they told you or something that you learned outside of their telling you? That's something that they told me that they were going to, going to be funded uh, a, a, a smaller insurance policy. And do you have a specific recollection that they told you that they were going to be funded from this smaller policy in the future? 
In other well, words, at, our, at our first meeting two weeks after that, they th felt they had a certain cash pool that was that was available to them <coughs> through either the insurance or through the estate or something, and they were, you know, they didn't want to just throw it away. They wanted to make sure that whatever they did with it was going to be wisely done. Did they ever tell you during any of these three to five discussions how much they thought the estate was worth? Your Honor, I'm going to object to this. It's way beyond the scope. Overall. Um, and I'm asking you specifically what they told you and not what you might have read in the newspapers. I guess if you added up the two policies, that's what they thought they had. And, and, and the house. All right. Were, whatever, whatever the equity in the house was. Did the defendants ever talk to you about whether or not they knew or thought that they were going to be the heirs to their parents' estate? No, no, I'm going to object to this. It's beyond the scope. The question is vague as to time. What, All right. When you, you first, when you met with the defendants the first time, which was approximately two weeks after, after you'd gone by the house, did you have any discussion with the defendants as to whether they thought they would be inheriting money from their parents? Your Honor, I'm going to object that it's irrelevant given the time frame. Overall. Well, that wasn't the, the, the purpose of the, the conversation. You understand that there, there was yeah. some mention that they that they thought they were going to be the, the the heirs of the estate. That's where they were going to get the money from. All right. So and they also had an uncle who was helping them. Okay. So your understanding was then that the first meeting they had with you, that the business advice portion of the meeting was not the <coughs> predominant feature of that meeting. Would that be fair to say? The first time I met with them, or the, uh, when they came to my office. When they came to your office the first time. They just were lost lost souls and needed some friend and some help and there was some you know we didn't really discuss the money aspect of insurance policies all that other stuff while well, we i just try to put them on the course that they would if that they if they could be tennis players they should be because they would never get another opportunity as they grew older and they should try to see if they had that that talent or they didn't have it and that's and, and eric should continue to go to school all right, and then during the course of that meeting, you also discussed the transportation needs. Is that correct? They, they said they both needed cars, and I said, you know, they said, what kind of car should we buy? And I said they should buy a car that isn't going to lose any money or very much money. And each of them had a preference, and I thought, you know, given the the, uh, the the insurance policy that was going to be given to them, that it would be that it wouldn't be a, 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 a an outlandish expenditure. And they asked me, and I told them that was okay. All right, so you knew when you recommend when you talked about the automobiles that. There was going to be insurance money made available to them. Is that correct? I, I re really am a little confused whether it was insurance money or whether it was coming from the uncle. But there was some, you know, <coughs> cash of money that they knew that they that they could, that they would that they were going to get. And you indicated that each of them had a preference for the kind of car that they wanted. Is that correct? Yes. And what preference did Lyle Menendez express? Objection, Your Honor. Overall, Lyle wanted a, a Porsche convertible. And what preference did Eric Menendez express to you at that time? He wanted a Jeep. Okay. A Jeep, a, a, a Jeep, you know, one of those Jeep uh, Wranglers, whatever they call them. All right. And I open take air, it, the open air one. And I take it you discuss with them the money situation and you determine that that would be feasible. Is that correct? I, I want to make sure they could afford it, and uh, that, that was correct. Okay. Now, on other occasions, aside from this first meeting at your office, did you have meetings with the defendants these three to five times, which centered more on business concerns than the meeting you've just described? No. I mean, they, they made the decision to go on to be tennis, go on to start working on their tennis and hire a tennis coach. They both went and bought their cars, and then a lot of it was centered around, you know, personal activities. We played chess, and we you know, just had nice, nice times together, and once in a while there would be discussion as to where they were going or what was going on, and I... They'd ask me a question, and I'd help them. Did the court, during this course of the time, well, when was the last time you saw them before they were arrested in March of 1990, if you recall? Probably several days before that. All right. How many times do you think you saw them in total between the time of the first time you met them in the driveway and the few days before their arrest? Well, Eric, more than Lyle, but uh, cumulatively, probably. 25, 20. And, and you would have seen Eric more times than Lyle? Lyle was more back east, and uh, Eric was here. All right. And um, during that period of time, did either of the defendants ever discuss with you how things were going with the, pol the insurance policy at Carolco? 
Um, maybe once or twice. And who said, who discussed it with you, if you recall? Well, there was a, we, he, the, the boys and myself had always had a, a, a difference of an opinion about it. They thought they were going to receive something from Caraco, and I said, there's no way that Caraco is going to give you anything. All right. Now, did they ever indicate to you that, in fact, they hadn't gotten any money from the company? They never did, to my knowledge. Well, did they ever tell you we're not getting money from the company? Um, or we still hope we are, or anything of that nature? I think that the arrest cut that short. All right. So, so we, we never we never did hear that. <clears throat> All right. And aside from the policy, the the smaller policy and the money from Carolco, um, did either of the defendants indicate to you any other assets that they thought they would be inheriting? And this has been asked and answered, Julie. Really. To state. Well, you indicated they thought that they were going to get the house in Beverly Hills. Is that correct? Yeah, right? this was asked and answered. It has been. Well, did they ever indicate to you anything about the house in Calabasas? Yes. What did they indicate to you about the house in Calabasas? That they had a house that was incomplete in a Calabasas and um, was vacant and needed some more work on it, and I, that's what they indicated. All right, and did they ever consult with you about doing the work since, in fact, you had built the house in which they had lived? They consulted me about having the work done, not by me, but to have it done, and I told them they should have it finished and, and get rid of it and, and sell was, it. Okay, was it your understanding that they intended to sell the house in Calabasas? Yes. Okay, thank you. I have nothing further. Redirect. Now, Mr. Slotkin, you knew that there was a lawyer working for, you knew the uncle was an executor of the estates of the parents? Yes. And you knew there was a lawyer working for the uncle, working for the executors? I talked to him, yes. Mr. Goldberg? I believe so, right. And it was your understanding, wasn't it, that all this information that Eric and Lyle are getting about Carolco and negotiating with them is coming from the lawyer? Objection. Calls for hearsay, Your Honor. Sustained as to the form of the question. Okay. Was that discussed with part of the witness? That the, 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 first of all, were you told that the lawyer was trying to negotiate with Carolco to see if Carolco would buy the house? Objection. Vegas to time. Can you be more clear as to who uh, the speaker was? By either of the brothers. Overall. Do you understand the question? Um, I think so. Um, I understood that the boys weren't dealing directly with Caraco, that there, there was an intermediary, and that it was either the uncle or the lawyer. Okay. And were the brothers telling you that they're being told by either the uncle or the lawyer that Carolco might be willing to <clears throat> buy the house because they had this big key man policy that benefited them. Objection leading. Overall. Yes. And you tried to uh, dissuade them from that belief because you didn't think a business would be that generous. Is that correct? Well, dissuade isn't really the word. It wasn't a question of persuading them one way or the other. I just told them that that wasn't, I didn't think that was going to happen. And they told you they were hearing other information from the uncle and the lawyer? Yes. Excuse me. The, the reason that this came up, if there's any yes. confusion, is because I had advised them that they should sell the house. Right. And they said that Caraco was going to buy the house from them. And so that's kind of how the whole thing came about. And in fact, at the time they were arrested, as far as what you understood was there was still this thing going on between the uncle and the lawyer and Caralco and the house had not been sold. Objection leading and calls for hearsay. Sustained. Was it your understanding at the time that uh, the brothers were arrested that the, as far as they understood, based on their, oh, strike that, based on your last conversation with either of them about this topic, Close in time to when they were arrested, were there still supposedly discussions going on between Carolco and the uncle and the lawyer about Carolco buying the house? Yes. And to the best of your knowledge, Mr. <coughs> Slotkin, the house had not even been put up for sale at the time that they were arrested. Is that correct? I believe that's right.
Now, you said that they seemed like lost souls. Did you think it unusual that these two young men, who were virtual strangers, came to you for advice? Objection and proper opinion. Sustained. Why do you think they came to you? Objection calls for speculation. Sustained. Why did you call them lost souls? Objection irrelevant. Sustained. What was it about them that made you feel that they um, needed your advice? Objection calls for a conclusion on the part of the <clears throat> witness. Sustained. Had you had any conversations of any kind with Eric or Lyle Menendez? Your Honor, may we approach? On what subject? Mugging. Huh. All right. Uh, <laughs> if there has been any um, demonstrations by any counsel, the jury is, both juries are admonished to disregard it. Any lawyer making any, or having any reaction to any of the testimony is inappropriate and is, uh, in essence, uh, counsel reacting and arguing or, uh, to the jury and their chance to argue to the jury is coming up very soon. They'll be arguing to you next week and at that point they'll be able to express verbally their views on the, the subject. So at this point the jury is admonished to disregard any reactions by any counsel. Thank you. Your next question. I just want to clarify, Mr. Slotkin, this first time you ever talked to Eric and Lyle Menendez about any kind of <coughs> investments or what they should do with their life or what was going on uh, concerning the death of their parents was two weeks after, at least two weeks after the parents died. Is that correct? Yes. And it was at that time, it was two weeks after you met them? I met them shortly after the parents died correct. and they called several weeks later to come down and see me. So it could have been more than two weeks even later. No, I don't think much more than that. All right. About two weeks after you first met them. I'm comfortable with that. Okay. And at that time is the, is the very first time you ever talked to them about any of these issues, about what they should do with their life, about what kind of money they might have access to in the near future, about things that the uncle and the lawyer may have been telling them. Is that correct? That's right. Did you uh, give them any advice about whether or not the <clears throat> uncle and the lawyer was giving them good advice? Objection calls for a conclusion on the part of the witness. You're asking what did he tell them? I'm asking if he gave them advice about that. All right, objection overruled. Um, yes. For, did they indicate to you that they were seeking advice from the uncle and the lawyer and seeking guidance from them as well? They were listening to the uncle and the lawyer, but it was kind of um, a thing where they, the uncle and, this, and the lawyer had already taken over whatever was, whatever, whatever was going to happen to the, to, the, to the boys financially, and uh, they questioned some of that, and we discussed it. And did you advise them that you didn't think they were being well advised? Well, I didn't, I didn't say it that way. We, my, 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 my big disagreement with everybody was that Caraco was not going to come, was not going to buy the house, so that they shouldn't rely on it. And they were of the very strong opinion that, you know, being advised from their, their advisors that that, that was going to happen. And I said they shouldn't rely on it. Okay. I have nothing for you. Examination on behalf of Lyleman is this. Mr. Slock, can you still have the photographs up there? Yes. <clears throat> Showing you 399F where you have pointed to the maid's uh, window which faces the outside. It looks in that photograph like it's a stationary window. Is that your recollection? No, I believe the window uh, opened. And can you tell from that photograph whether it's a stationary window or not? I really can't, and, and I, I'm really not sure, but... Do you have a recollection one way or the other? I, th I would think that it opened just because you would like to have the air, somebody be able to open the air up if they wanted to, but I, I, I don't have a definite recollection one way or the other. 
Now, I believe you testi testified that in that first uh, meeting with them at the house, uh, right after the killing, that the uh, subject of business was not discussed in any way whatsoever, correct? The first time I met them? Yes. No. And I think you said something indirect about uh, fatherly advice. Did you use those um, words? I just said that if they needed a friend or some sort of, you know, father figure because I'm twice their age, uh, I'd be happy to help them if possible. And then the meeting approximately two weeks later followed on that suggestion by you, correct? Part of that. Part of the meeting was that, yes. And did they come into that meeting with a, a, an agenda of business items that they wanted to discuss with you? Well, it was less formal than that, but they, they wanted to discuss their future. What, what would they do now? And did they seem to have uh, the sophistication that you did in business affairs when they came in at that time? No. You characterize them as being lost souls. What, what did you mean by that in reference to the business discussions that you were having on that? Well, they, 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 had, they didn't have a direction. They had things that had been so interrupted for them. They did not have a direction as to what they were going to do or with their lives or with anything. And they, need, they just needed somebody to sit down and, and, you know, impartially talk to them. And that was your clear impression from that conversation two weeks after the killings, correct? Well, that part of it, plus we were making friends and, you know, talking about people that we might know in common and so forth and so forth. Thank you. That's all I have. Any recross? I have one question. Mr. Slotkin, did either of the defendants ever tell you that they killed their parents? No, they didn't say that. Thank you. All right. You may step down. You're excused. Your next Thank witness. You. Mark Somebody getting him? Mark C. Heffernan, H E F F E R N A N. Mark, M-A-R-K. Mr. Heffernan, is your correct title Dr. Heffernan? Yes, it is. And you're a psychologist? I'm uh, soon to be a psychologist. I'm so a psychological intern right now. Um, you know Lyle and Eric Menendez, is that correct? That's correct. When did you first meet them? I met them, I believe, um, in the fall, uh, the early fall of 1988. And did you become their tennis coach? Soon thereafter. And were you coaching both of the boys? Uh, I was coaching both of the boys. I started with Lyle and Eric followed and then I pursued Eric Moore when Lyle went to school. And were you still their coach in the summer of 1989 when their parents died? Yes, I was. And did they have any other coach at that time? Not to my knowledge. And at the time that their parents died, were you still employed as their coach? Yes, I was. You had not been terminated or given any indication that your services would not be needed in the future, is that correct? That's correct. How often would you be at the Menendez home to coach one or the other of the boys? Um, hmm. I'd say six to ten hours a week. And were there times when the Menendez parents, one or both of them, would be outside watching the session? Yes. And I'd like to show you a photograph which has previously been marked as 387. May I approach your honor? Yes. Dr. Heffernan, do you recognize the area depicted in that photograph? Yes, I do. There appears to be <coughs> some lawn furniture, a patio table and chairs, which are in front of the guest house. Did you see that? Yes, I did. And do you remember seeing this patio furniture in this location? Yes, I did. And would there be times when the Menendez parents would sit 
in that patio furniture at, at that table and watch the practice sessions? They would. And did you ever see a time when this table and chairs set up was moved into this walkway between the tennis court and the swimming pool? Never the table, occasionally the chairs. Would there have been room for the table to have been moved in that area? I'm not sure. Um, I, I don't remember seeing it there. In all of the times you were there, did you ever see the table in this placed in this walkway between the tennis court and the swimming pool? Or was it in the place depicted in that photograph back by the guest house? I would say it was back there. Mm -hmm. During the times that, that you were working with either Lyle or Eric and the parents were outside, would the parents comment on the training that was going on? Um, would, Mr. Menendez would occasionally. Okay. Let, me, let me ask you first. Would Mrs. Menendez ever give instructions, make comments, interfere in the session in any way? No. Did Mr. Menendez sometimes? Yes, he did. And when he would make comments, would the boys respond using uh, vulgarity or swear at him? Not to my knowledge, no. During all of the times that you were there, did you ever hear either Eric or Lyle Menendez swear at their parents? No, I didn't. Now, were there occasions when they would make a mistake on the court and they would be angry at themselves and express it verbally? Absolutely. Is that unusual? No, that's very usual. Yeah, I can barely hear the witness. All right, you can move a little closer. Sorry. <laughs> now, when I say is that unusual, what was it unusual? For them to have reacted that way, or is it, I'm sorry, let me start again. When I asked you about them making a mistake and getting angry at themselves and expressing it verbally, you said that was <coughs> common, it was usual. Yes, it was common. And is it common among other players you've coached? Yes, it is. Very competitive players are, tend to be hard on themselves. Mm -hmm. And you played tennis for a good part of your life, is that correct? That's correct. And in your experience, both as a player and a coach, would you see this kind of behavior where people get angry at themselves and express it? Often. Were you with Lyle Menendez in July of 1989 in New York? Yes, I was. And were you there for some sort of a tennis tournament yourself? Yeah, I was playing a national tournament at, at the at U.S. Tennis Center. And. Were you with Lyle Menendez when he bought a camcorder? Yes, I was. And did you discuss with him the purpose for which this was intended? Uh, I think so. Um, I think we were going to use it for tennis, for tennis videoing. Could you, uh, perhaps you can move the microphone a little bit. No, we have to move it with the... Oh, I can do that. Mr. and Mrs. Menendez died on Sunday, August 20th. Do you remember being at the house sometime prior to that? I remember being there Friday morning, I believe. And were you there on Saturday? No, I was not. And do you have any memory, as any specific memory, as to whether there were plans for you to be there on Saturday or whether the family had other plans? No, there was no plans for me. They were going fishing on Saturday, and we were going to touch base on Sunday. They usually touched base with me, so I didn't. they didn't call, so I didn't. I presume they had something to do on Sunday. But you're sure you were not there on Saturday? I'm sure. And you have blonde hair, I notice? I, I think I do. Did you have blonde hair on... Uh, mm -hmm. August 19th, 1989. I think I still did. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I have nothing further. Thank you. <coughs> I have a
Examination on behalf of Eric Menendez. Mr. Heffernan, um, when you were in New York with Lyle Menendez, uh, you believe that was July of 1989? I believe it was. Uh, and uh, you were with him when he purchased this camcorder to use it for tennis? Yes. And, and you would use it for tennis by recording what you're doing and then be able to look at the video and improve your game and work yes. hard Is that right? Overall. Is that yes, yes that's using? correct. Where was Eric Menendez when you and Lyle were in New York together? I can't remember. Was he in New York? He was not. And did you understand as Eric's tennis coach that that summer he would be competing in a number of tournaments around the country? Yes. Did you see him, in fact, over the course of that summer until after the tournaments were over? I did see him. He was traveling, and in between traveling, he'd be home, and we'd work on his game and prepare him for, for tournament play. So you'd see him in between the tournaments back home? Yes. I have nothing for you. Oh, wait, I do, I do, have, I do have one question. Um, you understood from working with Eric and Lyle since <coughs> the fall of 88 that as of the summer of 89, you were the only person who was coaching. Is that right? Yes, I believe I was. And you would have known if they were working with another coach, wouldn't you? Objection calls for speculation. Sister. In your experience, if one of your players has other coaches, isn't that fact discussed or you can figure it out from how they're playing? Objection calls for speculation. Overall. Is it irrelevant? Overall, you can answer the question. I believe it would have been discussed. I, I have clients currently that work with coaches, and, uh, and I, as a sports psychologist, I know the team that's involved. Okay. Mm -hmm. And did you know when you were working w uh, with Eric that in years past, he, there had been times when he had multiple coaches? Yes. The tennis court behind <coughs> the Menendez home, is it a north-south court or an east-west court? East-West. And with an East-West court, does that cause part of the court to go into shadow at different times of the day? It does. It's more that the sun's at an interesting angle, and it's, it's a little more challenging to play there in late afternoon. Yeah, especially if you're facing West. Is yes. That correct? Okay. I have yeah, I have one question. All right. Sure. Mr. Hassan, when did you first learn that Ma Menendez had a hairpiece? I think throughout this trial proceedings, the trial proceedings. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm Cross examination. Thank you, Your Honor. Mr. Heffernan, who paid for the lessons for the uh, these men, these defendants? Um, Mrs. Menendez usually paid. I think it came from from uh, Jose's business account. I think, if I remember correctly. And what did they pay per hour for lessons? Your Honor, I'm going to object to this in front of my jury because this witness has already testified to all this Overall. in front of my jury. Overall. $55 an hour. And you indicated that on Friday, that would be August 18th, 1989, you gave a lesson to the defendants. Is that correct? I gave a lesson to Eric, I believe, in the morning. Now, do you recall when that lesson was given? Your Honor, I would object to this as asked and answered during Overall. this case. Overall. I believed it was 9.30 in the morning, 9 or 9.30 for a couple of hours. So 9.30 until 11.30? Yes. And that's uh, Friday, correct? Friday. How do you recall that particular date? Was there something that uh, was discussed between you and Defendant Eric Menendez about the next day being a Saturday? I believe that they said they were going fishing and they wouldn't be available on Saturday. But that's all I remember. Do you recall talking to Eric Menendez and telling him or being told by him that he would call you on Sunday? I believe... I'd like to approach that. Overall. I believe that that was the plan. He was going to call me on... object to the people re-examining the same way... Overall. Overall. 
was your answer, sir? I believe that he was going to call me if we were going to have a session on Sunday. And uh... now you said that you were with Lyle Menendez in New York in July of 1989. Is that correct? That is correct. Do you know when that was? Was it early July? Um, I'm not, you know, I, I think it was the first week in July, however, I could be mistaken, it was a, a tournament that I had to play, uh, one of the national tournaments, and I'm not sure the date, I can't, can't be sure. Your best recollection is it was the first week in July? I think so. May I approach, no. What do you have in your question? Nothing. I'm just going to approach the uh, chart. Well, picture. Picture. Sir, would you take a look at this uh, photograph uh, depicting the, the guest house and the pool? And to this side would be the uh, tennis court. How did you get onto that court? How would one go onto the court to play tennis? There was a gate, I believe, in the middle of the small fence as you walk further down. Okay, when you say the small fence, would that be in the center yes. area of this photograph? Yes, it would. So there was an open area? Yeah, there was an open area. I think there was a small gate. Uh, it was open all the time. And you had seen chairs uh, over in the area between the pool and the tennis court where the parents would watch uh, the defendants play tennis? Yes. And would the parents watch the... Uh, Defendants played tennis quite a bit when you uh, gave lessons? Oh, Jose would come out when he was around and I was there at the same time he was. Uh, usually he would come out. Kitty came out far less and neither of them came out a lot. I taught them in the daytime and, uh, and Jose was working. And if he had a business meeting in there, I would carry out my business and he wouldn't see it. So on the few occasions that you actually saw the parents out in that area, uh, there was no argument, no yelling and screaming between the defendants and their parents? No, not on the court. No cussing? Not toward the parents. I never heard the parents cuss at the boys either, so. Now when you say you didn't notice arguments on the court, did you notice arguments between the parents and the brothers off the court? About petty things, occasionally with, the, I think Kitty would say, uh, you have to do this and the boys would be mad. You know, I think relatively harmless family squabbles. Would, would you ever hear the brothers cuss on the court in the presence of their mother when she was out in the backyard watching the lessons? They would have had to make a very bad shot. Okay. Very bad. I, I can't really recall that, to tell you the truth. Now, you indicated that uh, they would get angry at themselves often on the court and they would swear. Is that correct? Uh, I wouldn't say often, but it, it happens for sure. If you're trying hard and you're not getting the results that you would like. And so that would happen occasionally when the parents were out in the backyard watching them in their lessons. Yes. That would be fair to say? That would be fair to say. Mm -hmm. Now, you've indicated that you weren't at the Menendez home on Saturday, August 19th, correct? That's correct. Are you aware that there were other players that played with the uh, Menendez brothers in their backyard? Objection, Your Honor. Assumes facts, not in evidence. Refresh question. Okay. Were there other players that played with the uh, defendants in the backyard on their tennis court? Yes, there were. You weren't with them all the time. No, I was not. They would have to get some pretty high caliber uh, players to play against them because they were pretty good tennis players, weren't they? That's correct. You don't know where they were on Saturday uh, during the afternoon on the uh, 19th of August, do you? Uh, I assumed they were fishing. That's what they said they were going to be doing. I'm not sure what time of day on Saturday that was happening, uh, but Saturday they were fishing. Did they indicate to you that they were going to go fishing uh, in the late afternoon on Saturday? I can't remember the time, to tell you the truth. Mm -hmm. 
Here, I have an American Express statement. May I have this mark next to I believe it's uh, 400. Your Honor, we're going to object to this as beyond the scope. Uh, you are to 400 and, um, Did you see it? Yes, I've shown it to counsel previously. You, you haven't shown it to Miss Lansing, Mr. Curiano. She's never seen it. Yeah, I'd like to approach. I'll hold off on this for the right. blue jerk. There'll still be an objection at this point. Right, Nothing further, just time. Mr. Heffernan, uh, did you have a playbook by which you would keep track of your appointments in 1989? Uh, I did for my students in general. Yes. Yes. It was uh, both a calendar and a, a way of noting their progress and what you were working on with them. Um, I wouldn't have that in the same book. Okay. Did you have a calendar book that told you when you were uh, yes. teaching? And you no longer have that book. Is that correct? That's that's correct. Now, was there any reason why you? Uh, I'll strike that. Did you, when you were coaching um, Eric Menendez and Lyle Menendez at their home, oh? Were there certain days of the week when you would never coach them, or could you see them on almost any day? I could see them on almost any day. It so you would, co you would teach on Thursdays just as easily as on Fridays, yes. is that right? And you say your best recollection is that you gave this lesson on Friday morning, is that correct? That is correct. And you, re you realize that Eric's best recollection is that it was on Thursday morning. Did you know that? I didn't know that. Okay. Do you have any way of being absolutely certain what morning it is without your calendar? Um, absolutely certain, I'd have to say no. But you do recall, do you not, that you didn't teach that weekend because you knew about the fishing trip and you were supposed to be called if you were needed for a lesson on Sunday? Yes. <coughs> I take it if you first learned um, that Lyle wore a hairpiece during trial, Eric never mentioned it to you during all the time that you coached him. Objection calls for here. Is that saying. correct? Beyond scope. Well, it's argumentative as phrased. You may rephrase the question. Okay. Um, Eric never mentioned to you anything about Lyle having a hairpiece, did he? Objection leading calls for hearsay. Rephrase the question. Did Eric ever <coughs> mention to you anything about Lyle having a hairpiece? Objection calls for hearsay. Overall. No, he did not. And you saw Eric, what, three or four times a week? <coughs> I would say that's fair on an average. And besides being his coach, did he, you were also, even then, um, involved in sports psychology? Yes. And did he, uh, was he close to you? I would think he would be close to me. He's closest yeah. to anybody? I'm not sure about that. I think he was closer to his friends, but. All right. Did you know Jamie Pisarsik, Lyle's ex-girlfriend? <coughs> yes, I did. Beyond the scope. Sustain. Um, can I have one moment? Yes. <coughs> I have nothing further. Anything else? Right? Mr. Priyama, anything else? Mr. Heffernan, do you recall testifying in this court on August 13th, 1993? Yes, I do. And do you recall testifying? Could I see? Yes. Here. Page 11,071. Uh, excuse me, I have copies.
Okay. I'm testing that one. Just a sure. 11,071. 11, <coughs> Starting at line 10. Just a I'm going to object, Your Honor, it's improper impeachment. No standards. It's not inconsistent. Yes, it is. Should I show the, the support one? <coughs> yes, why don't you show it? the objections overall. Thank you, Your Honor. May I approach a witness, Your Honor? Yes. I'm sorry, is there a reason to approach? I assume he's going to show him the transcript, is yes, that sir. it? Is he's being shown to refresh his recollection, is that the idea? Yes. You should take a look at uh, this page, 11,071, starting at line 10, down to the bottom of that page. Yes, I think so. Mr. Heffernan, do you recall testifying on August 13th, I believe it was, in the fashion as indicated on 11,071? I don't recall, but I see that I said that, so. Okay. Does that refresh your recollection as to what it was? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, do you recall being asked by Mrs. Abramson, was it something about that last coaching date before the parents died that makes you believe it occurred on Friday? And you answered yes. She then asked, August 18th. If he remembers, he can be asked the question. So Overall. To read it. Overall. Mrs. Abramson asked, August 18th? You answered, yes, there was. The question then was, would you tell us what that was? And you replied, I was. I was seeing what their schedule would be for the weekend. And he said, well, we're not going to be taking a lesson tomorrow because we're going fishing with our parents. That was your statement, correct? Correct. And Mrs. Abramson then asked, this is, Eric said, I can't take a lesson tomorrow, which would be Saturday, and you answered yes. Next question, because we're going fishing with our parents, and you answered, and I believe he said he would call me on Sunday to let me know what we are doing for either the rest of the weekend or next week. Is that correct? I guess it's correct. Thank you. Um, Mr. Heffernan, four years later, can you be sure that what Eric said was tomorrow versus Saturday? Uh, when I originally thought of this, I think that I believed that I taught him on, sa on Friday. Mm -hmm. And uh, I guess as the trial's gone on, my memory is fading. <laughs> So I'm, I'm just, I guess I have to go on what I've said in the past that's closer to the events. Would you believe it, but you can't be absolutely sure because you don't have a calendar to show it. Yes, I, I cannot be absolutely sure. That's all. Thank you. Anything else? Nothing further. All right. Thank you. May I step down? Thank you. My name is William Janago, and that's spelled G-E-N-E-G-O. Mr. Janago, what is your present occupation? I'm an attorney. And where did you get your undergraduate degree? At New York University. And where did you go to law school? Um, I went to Yale Law School. When did you graduate? In 1975. And did you then go on to get a graduate degree uh, in law beyond that? Yes, after receiving my Juris Doctorate at Yale in 1975, I then continued with my legal education at Georgetown University and received an LLM degree in 1977. 
And during the time that you were at uh, Yale Law School, were you the editor of the Law Review? Uh, yes, I was one of the editors of the Law Review, that's correct. Okay. The and Law Journal, actually, it's called. Okay. And since uh, graduating, besides practicing law, have you been a professor at various law schools? Uh, yes, I have. And which law schools specifically have you taught at? Um, I was a professor at the University of Southern California Law Center for about eight years, and I also was a professor at Georgetown University, and I've also taught at UCLA Law School and Boston University Law School at various times. And during the time that you were a, in private practice, have you worked both as a prosecutor and as a defense attorney? I did practice for a period of time as a prosecutor, and I've also practiced as a defense lawyer. Did I ask you to review the testimony of a witness in this trial? Yes, you did. Okay, and was that Miss Jamie Pizarsik? That's correct. And did I uh, direct you particularly to some testimony she gave with regard to looking up cases in the law library? Yes, you did. And is it um, basically her testimony? Yeah, I objected this as being argumentative before. I question. Was the testimony I asked you to review that part of her testimony in which she indicated that she looked up cases in the law library in which children were accused of killing their parents and had claimed sexual abuse and had gotten off, been acquitted, or found not guilty. Is that a fair summary? Your Honor, I'd object to this. The testimony speaks for itself, and it, I'd object to it as calling for a conclusion on the part of the witness. Without characterizing exactly what the witness said in general, did you review that portion of her testimony? Yes, I did. And was there something about the idea of, of someone looking up cases where someone gets off or is acquitted or is found not guilty, which stood out to you? Yes, there was. And why was that? Because in a criminal case, when a defendant is acquitted by a jury, the case is never reported because there's no appeal. And so there would be no case reporting an acquittal of a defendant who had, convicted, had killed their parents. Okay. Now, uh, directly to your left up on the bench, Your Honor, could you hand him just a few books that are there? All right, we'll give you one here. Okay. <laughs> that should work. And what do you recognize that to be? This is the official California reports. And what is that? This is a uh, volume of a series of volumes that are published which contain written decisions of appellate courts. And when lawyers say they go to the library to look up cases, they go to a volume such as this to look at reported cases that are written by appellate courts. Now, I've put a piece of paper up on the uh, board next to you. Um, and I would ask if you could approach there, could you just draw for us what happens to cases once they get out of the trial court? Sure. And show, the, show where they go from there. This is going to be marked as Exhibit 401. That would be fine if we may, Your Honor. 401. Now, is, is it fair to say that all cases that are tried start out in the trial court, such as what we have here? That is correct. And if we wanted to start with a trial court, let's say we could. That's right, put it way at the bottom of the chart. That's OK. <laughs> <laughs> I'll put it in capital letters. Then. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Is it fair to say that some cases that come out of a trial court result in acquittals or not guilty verdicts? Yes, that's right. If you had a not guilty verdict, let's say, <clears throat> that would be, let's say, a not guilty verdict. That would not go up on appeal because the defendant is found not guilty and the state is not allowed to appeal, and therefore that case would be off to the side, let's say. And would it be published in law books such as you've referred to here? No. The only cases which are published in law books are those of appellate courts. And since this is a trial court and not an appellate court, the verdict of not guilty would not be reported in those books. Okay. Now, would you indicate on the chart the cases where there are guilty verdicts? If the defendant is found guilty, let's say we'll have another box up here. That defendant 
would appeal, could appeal, has the right to appeal, and then that would go up to the first level of appeal in California is the Court of Appeal. And there's various courts of appeal that sit in, in the state of California. So a defendant who was found guilty has the opportunity to appeal his or her case to the Court of Appeal, whereas a defendant who's found not guilty, that case is never appealed. When the Court of Appeal decides the case, they write an opinion. They address legal issues, and the written opinion addressing those legal issues are contained in volumes such as that one. Now, after the Court of Appeal, a defendant also has the option of petitioning the California Supreme Court to review his or her conviction. And when the California Supreme Court, if they agree to hear the case, decides it, they too would write a written opinion addressing legal issues. And when that opinion is written, it would be reported in a book such as that one there. And then finally, um, a defendant has the option, if he has certain types of claims, of trying to get his case to the US Supreme Court, which would be the final level of appeal. And again, if a defendant had his or her case heard by the US Supreme Court and they were to write an opinion, that opinion would again uh, address legal issues and would be written in a book such as that. Okay. And then finally, um, a defendant has the option, if he has certain types of claims, of trying to get his case to the US Supreme Court, which would be the final level of appeal. And Again, if a defendant had his or her case heard by the U.S. Supreme Court and they were to write an opinion, that opinion would again uh, address legal issues and would be written in a book such as that. Okay. Could you, before you resume your seat, just draw a few diagonal lines across Court of Appeals, California Supreme Court, and U.S. Supreme Court to show which types of cases would be published in the books? Thank you. So I take it the trial court opinions would not be published. You would not find the not guilty cases. Is that, that is correct? right. They are not contained in a, in a case report. <laughs> so if someone says they went to a law library to look up cases where defendants got off, were found not guilty, or acquitted, that's an impossibility. Is that correct? There are no such cases. Thank you. I have nothing further. I have Cross examination. Please, 15 minutes. Do you want to do it? 15 minutes? I think so, yeah. Okay, then we'll do it at 1.30. Uh, don't discuss the matter with anyone, ladies and gentlemen. Don't form any final opinions about it. We'll resume at 1.30. With the examination of the witness, cross-examination. Mr. Janago, I believe you indicated that you're a lawyer, correct? That's correct, yes. How many years did you have to go to school after you graduated from college to become a lawyer? Three years. And at the completion of that, that three-year period, did you have to take any kind of exam to be licensed by any state to practice law? Yes, I did. And what is the name of that exam? Um, most people refer to it as a bar examination. And does the bar examination last anywhere from two and a half to three days in most states? Depending upon where you take it, yes, that's correct. And if you don't pass the bar exam, you, you cannot practice law in a state, is that correct? That's correct. Okay. So you need three years of schooling, and is that full-time schooling? It depends on the state that you're going to ask to be licensed in. I think that certain states, for example, California, uh, one does not need to attend law school at all, and you can still take the bar exam under certain circumstances. Okay. Um, and in order to do that, you have to take a certain series of tests, correct? That's correct. Known as the baby bar. That's correct. Okay. Uh, now, w you reviewed the testimony of Ms. Pizarsik, correct? That's correct, I did. Did you see any signs in there that Ms. Pizarsik had gone to law school? No. Did you see any signs in there that Ms. Pizarsik had passed the bar exam? No. And do you remember the first mention in the transcript where Ms. Pizarsik used the term got off or gotten off? No, I don't remember the first time that she used that phrase. May I have the witness, please? Yes. 129. <coughs> showing you volume 129, referring to page 22,267. You see there at line 27, her answer, 
the cases were situations where children had gotten off after killing their parents? Do you see that? Term? I do see that, correct. Okay, that term gotten off, you, you, you are familiar with it as regards to Ms. Kazarsik's testimony, correct? Do you mean, did I read it where she used it? Yes. Yes. That's okay. correct. I'm showing you um, a, what's called a Black's Law Dictionary. Do you recognize this particular I, kind I of I do dictionary? recognize Black's Law Dictionary, yes. And this is a dictionary that defines legal terms, correct? Yes. Okay. And this is something that you can find in almost all of the law libraries around the country, correct? Sure. Correct. Okay. I'm going to open up to the G's and ask here, do you see the term gotten off in the Black's Law Dictionary? Not unless I'm spelling it incorrectly. All right, so it doesn't appear in the Black Law Dictionary, correct? No. Now, why does a defendant, a criminal defendant, appeal his case to a higher court in the trial court? In general, uh, you're asking not in a specific case, it's generally why? Yeah, generally. Why? Okay, when a defendant, okay, let me just leave. When a defendant gets convicted of a crime, many times that defendant will go to the next level to the Court of Appeals, correct? I don't know what the exact percentage is. A number of defendants do choose to appeal their convictions, that's correct. Right. Some don't. Well, if they don't, then if they don't choose to appeal their conviction, then that wouldn't appear in the law books either, right? That's correct. If someone does not appeal their case, that would not appear, would not result in a written opinion, and there would be no uh, case reported. Okay. So the only people who appeal their convictions are people that choose to do so, right? There are some circumstances in which there are automatic appeals, but barring those few situations, um, the overwhelming majority of criminal appellate cases are those in which the defendant makes the decision to, to pursue an appeal, correct? And in pursuing the appeal, he's trying to get the Court of Appeals to do something for him, correct? Uh, yes, he or she is ordinarily trying right. to get the Court of Appeal to do something. I don't mean to be sexist. So he or she goes to the Court of Appeals because they've been convicted of an offense and they want the court to give them something, right? I don't know what you mean by give them something. They would like they would like the court to render a decision that's favorable to them, I suppose, if that if that's what you mean. And if the decision is favorable to them, that will result in them getting off, right? Uh, no. Well, um, when the Court of Appeals renders a decision, they don't find someone not guilty, do they? No. It's not the job of the Court of Appeals to uh, make a factual determination of guilt or innocence as an initial matter. That's correct. And Courts of Appeals do not use terms like the defendant is, we now find the defendant not guilty. That doesn't happen, does it? That's correct. That does not happen. And the Court of Appeal doesn't say, we acquit the defendant either, do they? Uh, there might be some rare, very rare circumstances, not in California, but some in other jurisdictions where for reasons of insufficiency of the evidence as a matter of law, there might be a situation in which a phrase such as that would appear in opinion, but I think I would agree with you that ordinarily that phrase would not be found in an appellate opinion, correct? And when a defendant goes to the Court of Appeal, he is seeking some sort of way to get his conviction overturned, correct? For the most part, I'd say that's correct, yes. Well, would you agree with me that most defendants do not appeal their case so that the court can tell them that the trial was fine and you're going to stay in jail, right? Most defendants don't do that. No, but there are circumstances in which people appeal their convictions because they disagree with the amount of time that they got or a sentencing issue, and that could be something that would not going to result in them getting off in any way uh, or getting out of jail, and still they would do it an appeal. Well, if somebody has a sentencing problem and they think the judge sentenced them to too much time and the court agrees with them, then they could in fact be released because the court can reduce the amount of time they're going to do, right? Um, I think what would happen in those circumstances, other than a jail credit issue, uh, as in most appellate proceedings, it would be remanded back to the trial court and there would be a new proceeding, probably a new sentencing at that point. So no, the person would not be released at that point. No, but the person would be released as a result of the actions of the Court of Appeals. No, I disagree. Well, if the Court of Appeals says you, you gave two sentences when you only should have given one under Penal Code Section 654, for instance, then that could result in an immediate reduction of sentence once the person sent back to the trial court, right? 
If the person has already served the time that's remaining on the other sentence. Sure. All right. Now, when a person goes to the Supreme Court of the state of California and appeals their criminal <coughs> conviction, they're going there so the Supreme Court will somehow let them go. I mean, that's the ultimate goal, isn't it, is to let them go. Uh, no, actually, I think that probably the overwhelming majority the overwhelming majority of criminal appeals result in a remand for another trial. The defendant doesn't get off because of an appellate decision. What happens is that they say there is some error in the initial trial, and they send it back so that there can be another trial. The appellate court doesn't release the person. And Well, no, the appellate court doesn't, because the way it works is the appellate court sends, as a matter of procedure, the body of and the case back to the trial court, correct? That's correct. All right. And sometimes when a new trial is granted, the people can't proceed because the witnesses are gone or something like that, and the defendant's released, right? I have an objective Sustained. Okay. Are you aware of cases in which um, people get new trials and the, the state can't proceed against that person because there are no more witnesses? Sustained. This is also irrelevant. Okay. Mr. Janago. Are you aware of the fact that there are cases in the, in the books, like the one the judge showed you this morning, where people are found guilty of lesser offenses? Yes. Okay. Would you describe to the jury, because you're a legal expert, what a lesser offense is? A defendant can be charged with a variety of different crimes. Some of them are more serious than others. And a jury may decide that uh, a defendant should be acquitted or found not guilty of a particular charge, but still might find that there's sufficient evidence of guilt on another charge, and for that reason, acquit a defendant of one charge and find the defendant guilty of another charge. For instance, in a burglary case, they might find the defendant guilty of second-degree burglary versus first-degree burglary, correct? That's correct. And therefore, the defendant has been acquitted of first-degree burglary because by virtue of the conviction of the second-degree burglary. That's correct. Likewise, in a murder case, if a person is charged with first-degree murder and is found guilty of voluntary manslaughter, then that person has gotten a lesser offense, correct? That they've been convicted of a lesser offense than what they were initially charged of, correct. All right. And in that particular situation, the person has been found not guilty of first-degree murder by virtue of the fact that they were found guilty of voluntary manslaughter, correct? Well, that's not necessarily true. I mean, it wouldn't have to be the case. It might be that a jury would reach that decision, but they might just return a verdict on the lesser included, or it might be some lesser charge in the charging instrument. So it wouldn't necessarily uh, mean that the jury would also, also find an acquittal with respect to the other charge. Mr. Janago, if the defendant is charged with first-degree murder uh -huh. and the jury finds him guilty of voluntary manslaughter, then he has not been found guilty of first-degree murder, has he? He has not been found guilty of first-degree murder. That's correct. Okay. And to a layperson, that might appear to be getting off, mightn't it? <laughs> Sustain. Okay. Now, did you ever ask Ms. Pizarsik what she meant by the term get off? I've never spoken with her. All right. Now, you're aware of the fact, are you not, that there are published opinions in books such as the one that the judge showed you where Defendants use a child abuse defense in order to justify their actions in a homicide case. Are you aware of that? Overall, do I have personal knowledge of, of any such cases, or do I believe such cases exist? Well, or do I think it would be possible that such a case could exist? Well, do you think it's <laughs> do you think it's no? Do you know that such cases exist? I don't have personal knowledge of any such case now. All right. Are you aware of the fact that child abuse is currently used as a defense to homicide in many parts of this country? Yes. All right. And if a person uses child abuse as a defense to homicide and is found guilty of voluntary manslaughter and not first-degree murder, that person has gotten off the first-degree murder charge, correct? It depends how you use the term gotten off. A person who was convicted under those circumstances could still face a lengthy time in prison because of their conviction of the manslaughter charge. And would that be getting off? I don't think so. Well, I guess it's from the point of view of the person who's going to do the time, isn't it? That's one perspective. I suppose other people would have different perspectives. All right. Um, are you aware of the fact that when cases um, are listed in these books, that oftentimes the, the particular facts of the case are listed. In other words, 
Joe Blow went to a bar with a gun and blew away one of the patrons. Do you understand that, that these cases contain very specific facts in them? Yes, that's All right. correct. And is it also true that at the beginning of the cases, at least in California, there's what's called a synopsis of the case, where there's usually two paragraphs which sum up the rest of the case, correct? That's correct. All right. And those two paragraphs, one of them tells you what happens in the trial court, and the second par paragraph tells you what the Court of Appeal or the Supreme Court did, right? Generally. Generally speaking, that's probably correct. I don't know if there's any specific format that's used in every case. I think it changes um, occasionally, but there is a summary which contains the basic information of what occurred below and then also what the decision of the appellate court is. Now, when a, a, a person goes to law school and they're learning about the law, what do they read? Many things. Do they read cases? One of the things they do read is reported cases. And when you teach in law school, do you have your students read reported cases? <laughs> yes. And is that how people can, was that one way by which people can learn about the law? That's one way people learn about the law. Okay. And these cases which contain the facts, they also contain legal theories, is that correct? Uh, they contain appellate judges' discussions of legal theories. And that's one of the major ways that law students are taught about the law, right? There's something that's known as case books that professors use, which contain excerpts of those cases in them that they use for instructional purpose, correct? And in fact, many of those cases that we have to read in law school, you have to read from beginning to end. Isn't that correct? If you want to understand them completely, yes. Your Honor, I'm going to object that this is beyond the scope. Well, it is uh, getting far afield, so let's. Uh, that wrap was my it up. last question in that area. Okay. Now, um, when a defendant goes to a court of appeal and asks the court to do something, there are several things the court can do, correct? Yes. Okay, one of the things the court can do is reverse the case, and that's the end of the case, correct? Reverse the case? In other words, the defendant's been convicted of something, and the court can reverse the case such an in, as cases of insufficiency of the evidence, and then the case is over, right? There could be a situation where an appellate court could find that the prosecution has not introduced sufficient evidence to meet its burden of proof. And for that reason, find that the prosecution's evidence is insufficient as a matter of law. And, and that would be the end of the case. That is theoretically possible. Well, th that's happened. I mean, it does happen. And, that, and therefore, the defendant who gets a reversal from the Court of Appeals or the Supreme Court has gotten off, correct? Yes, but in those circumstances, what happens is that the prosecution's evidence is determined to be insufficient as a matter of law. It's not based on the convincing nature of a defendant's proof. So it's not as a result of a defense that someone's uh, case ends at that point in the appellate court. It ends in the appellate court under those rare circumstances where the prosecution, as a matter of law, has not introduced enough evidence to even warrant a conviction. Are you telling me that in those particular cases they never discuss the defense at all? They might. All right. And in those particular cases, then the defendant would get off, correct? That's correct, if the right. prosecution did not submit a sufficient case. The other thing is, is the Court of Appeal could reduce the charges. In other words, the Court of Appeal might decide that um, the, the charge with which the defendant was convicted is too much or too high, and the court could reverse the, or reduce that charge to a lesser charge, correct? There are very strict uh, legal rules which govern an appellate court's uh, authority to alter a jury's verdict in that way, but there are circumstances in which, again, they could find that the evidence as a matter of law was not sufficient to support a finding on a particular charge and find that it was sufficient to support a lesser charge or a different charge and therefore affirm the conviction on that charge but not affirm it on the other charge. That's correct. So, for instance, if the court reduced a first-degree murder conviction to a voluntary manslaughter, then the defendant would then have suffered a lesser conviction by virtue of the Court of Appeals action, correct? That's correct. Okay. The other thing the court can do is reverse the case and send it back for a new trial, correct? That is correct. And that's one of the things we've discussed already? Yes. Okay. And the other thing the court can do is say, no, the conviction's fine, we're just going to leave it where it is, correct? They can affirm the conviction, that's correct. And in 
almost all of these situations where a case is taken to the Court of Appeal and it ends up in a book like the one that you had before lunch, the facts of that case are almost always discussed. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Now, uh, there, are other, there are several ways by which a defendant can get into the Court of Appeals. For instance, after a criminal conviction, he can end up there because he's appealing his conviction, correct? That's correct. There are also ways by which the prosecution can appeal pretrial rulings, correct? Yes. In other words, there would be perhaps a motion to suppress evidence which was granted, and the prosecution appeals that. There are limited circumstances in which the prosecution can appeal before the trial has begun certain legal rulings. That's correct. And there are other cases where a defendant's case is dismissed on what's called a 995 motion and the people appeal. That's correct. And those are cases where the defendant has already gotten off and then the people appeal the judge's ruling letting that defendant go, correct? Prior to trial, yes. Okay. So there are a number of ways in which a court of appeal or the Supreme Court can benefit defendants, correct? Yes. And to a layperson, those benefits might be construed as getting off, correct? Again, it depends on what you mean by getting off. If the person's conviction is still affirmed, they're still doing a substantial time in prison, whether that's getting off is debatable. But I suppose to the extent that some people might read that as some favorable actions for a defendant, even though the defendant is still going to do a long time in prison, that might be getting off, I suppose. Well, you would agree, would you not, that doing a life term with no parole is a lot worse than doing six or eight years in state prison, correct? Yes. All right. Thank you. I have nothing further. Any redirect? Yes, Sean. Mr. Janego, you read Ms. Pizarsic's testimony, is that correct? Yes, I did. And she talked about getting acquittal and about getting acquitted or being found not guilty, is that correct? Yes, she specifically said not guilty, that's right. And she talked about cases in which children are charged with killing their parents and claim sexual abuse as a defense. Yes, I believe is that, that correct? testimony. Yes. Now, Ms. Pizanich asked you if there are pre-trial rulings that could end up in the Court of Appeals. Is that yes. correct? She asked you such as when the prosecution could appeal a 995. That's correct, she did. Or when the prosecution could appeal a, a ruling on a search issue. That's right. Now, in those cases, would there have been any defense presented? No, none whatsoever. So there would be no cases that would fit the facts that Ms. Pizarsic referred to, which is children alleging child abuse, that would fit into the category she's referred to. Is that correct? That's correct. So if we're taking, let, strike that. The cases in which the prosecution can appeal would occur before any defense was presented. That's Is that correct? correct? They, they would occur prior to trial, and they would occur before any defense was presented. That's right. So there would be no cases such as she has described here in that category that would come anywhere near what Ms. Pizarsic is referring to. Is that correct? That is correct, yes. Now, she's asked you about situations in which the Court of Appeals or the Supreme Court would reverse the case, and the case would be over. And you talked about where the evidence just wasn't sufficient. That is, is that, correct. An is appellate correct? court does have the authority, uh, under very limited circumstances, to find that the prosecution's evidence, as a matter of law, the prosecution's evidence was not sufficient to support a conviction, okay. and for that reason, terminate the case at that point. Is that extremely rare? Uh, it's very, very rare. Okay. And she also asked you a situa about a situation in which the Court of Appeals can reduce the charge, which is go to a less serious charge. Is that correct? Yes. Is it true that the most common situation that you're going to see in cases that are appealed are that the cases are sent back for a new trial? The overwhelming majority of appellate cases are affirmed, but even in those limited cases where a defendant receives something favorable from an appellate court, what it generally is is a remand or the case is sent back from the appellate court back to the trial court for a new trial. That's correct. 
Now, you were asked extensively about whether getting off, uh, what the meaning of getting off would be. And, and I think you indicated that subjective uh, to somebody getting a lesser charge could conceivably mean getting off. It depends how the individual is using that term. That's correct. Right. And Mrs. Bazanich specifically referred to getting six or eight years uh, as, as getting off. Yes. Do you have any reason to believe that someone who got convicted of manslaughter would only get six or eight years? Uh, no. In fact, the legal term that's authorized is much longer than that. A person who's convicted of manslaughter can do much longer in prison than that. And when you read Ms. Bazarsik's testimony, <coughs> did it appear to be clear that she was talking about people who at trial were found not guilty? <coughs> Oh, I didn't quite hear the question. Can I have it read back? Or why don't you just re-ask it? If I can, Your Honor. All right. um, directing court and counsel to page 22460, starting at line 26. Uh, when you were reviewing the transcript, did you see the question that said, when I asked Ms. Mazarsik, when you said got off, they were found not guilty. They were acquitted because of this. Is that correct? And she answered, correct. Do you remember seeing that? Yes, I did uh, read that portion of the transcript. And I asked her later at 22461, you're very clear that they were acquitted. And she answered, well, yeah. If you read something like that, I would say a red flag would go up in your head. It did with me. I went, whoa, surprising. Do you remember reading that? Yes, I do remember reading that. And do you remember my asking her, are you aware there are no published cases of children who are charged with killing their parents who claim sexual abuse and are acquitted? And she said, maybe the ones Law was asking me to look at were appealed cases. I don't know. And I said, but you said they were acquitted or found not guilty. And she answered, well, that is what I remember. And then I asked, but you remember specifically they were found not guilty. And she answered, that was the context of the defense. Yes. Is that re what you recall? Yes, I remember reading that. Do you remember her saying anything about having their sentence reduced? No. Do you remember her saying anything about having the charges reduced? No. Mrs. Bazanich asked you about the summary that appears at the beginning of a case. Yes. Is it true that that summary <coughs> almost always starts out, defendant was convicted of X. Generally speaking, that's the way most of those summaries begin. That's correct. Do you remember reading any case that came out of a trial court that said defendant was acquitted? Is that no. the way they begin? No, they do not begin that way. So the, the reference is always to what crime it was they were convicted of. That's correct, because only the defendant can appeal the conviction. That's correct. So if someone is reading, a, a lay person, someone who's not trained in the law and is reading through the summary of the cases, the first line that's going to jump out at them is that the defendant was convicted. Is that correct? That's correct. Thank you. I have nothing further. Anything else? Okay. All right. Now let's see you at the sidebar here. Mr. Janago, you came here to testify because you have special knowledge about the law that Ms. Pizarsic does not possess. Is that correct? I don't know if that's why I came here to testify. I think that I have certain knowledge about the law that she doesn't have. That's a fair statement. And you're here as a legal expert. Isn't that correct? Yes. Okay. Now, do people appeal convictions even when they've been found guilty of lesser offenses? Yes. All right, so for instance, if someone were found guilty of, let's say, involuntary manslaughter, um, they might still appeal that conviction even though they were charged originally with murder, correct? That's correct. Okay. I believe you indicated that um, when there are pre-trial um, appeals by the prosecution that the defense would not be presented in the written opinions published in the advance sheets. Is that your testimony? I think what I testified was that a defense would not have been presented at that point in time. And for that reason, the opinion would not ordinarily discuss the defense because none had been presented. Except that if there was a defense presented at a preliminary hearing, then that defense might be discussed in the advance sheet, correct? 
It's possible, although it's very unlikely, because the 995 motion would deal with the sufficiency of the prosecution's evidence. That's the legal determination that's being made at that point. Yes, but if in fact there was a defense presented at the preliminary hearing, then the, then the defense would be part of the discussion of the facts of the case in the 995 appeal, correct? I suppose that's theoretically possible, depending upon what kind of defense it was, because the kind of defenses that one could present at a 995 or at a preliminary hearing motion are limited in and of themselves. May I approach, please, with the transcript? Of what? It's, uh, it's 130, volume 130. All right. What page? Page 22460. And you noticed here the question that was asked of you by Ms. Lansing, starting at line... Um, I don't believe it. 26. Do you see here that the question was by Miss Lansing to the witness, when you said got off, they were found not guilty, they were acquitted because of this. Is that correct? So those were Miss Lansing's words. Is that correct? If you represent to me that's what uh, that transcript is, I take your word for it, yes. Do most lawyers know legal terms better than most civilians? Yes. That's why they went to law school, right? To learn all those legal terms? I don't think that's why they went to law school. Sustained. All right, anything else? Just briefly. Uh, Ms. Mrs. Bazanji's references to the 995, yeah, um, is it in felony cases, are there generally hearings that are held without a jury before the trial to see if the people have enough evidence to go to the next level? That is correct. And that's called a preliminary hearing? Yes. And if you have a 995, it is someone evaluating the sufficiency of the people's evidence at that preliminary hearing. Is that correct? Right. Prior to the trial, uh, if it's a case in which there's a preliminary hearing, that means without a jury, the prosecution presents its case. And there's a legal determination at that point as to the sufficiency of the prosecution's proof. If a defendant disagrees and says that the evidence is insufficient as a matter of law, there is a penal code section, and it's section 995, which authorized him or her to ask for review of that legal decision about the sufficiency of the prosecution's evidence. Is it extremely rare that you would find any case of this nature in the law books to begin with? Yes. And. Is it even rarer that there would have been any defense presented? Yes, it would be even rarer. And again, as I mentioned before uh, during cross-examination, the kinds of defenses that one can present at a preliminary hearing are limited in and of themselves. And people are not acquitted or found not guilty in this kind of a setting, are they? No, they're not. And it's not called a trial, is it? No, it is not. So if someone talks about having a trial and people getting acquitted or found not guilty, they wouldn't be talking about this very rare circumstance you're talking about called a 995. Is that no. correct? Judge, I'll just take the Sustained answer, sir. That would not be an appropriate term to use. Trial would not be an appropriate term to use under these circumstances. Is that correct? There would have been no trial, so it would not be an appropriate term to use. And so if someone was looking at a published case of a 995 of that nature, words such as trial would not appear in the opinion. Is that correct? That's correct. To the contrary, the Court of Appeal would make it quite clear that it was judging the sufficiency of the prosecution's case on a 995 motion prior to trial. Mr. Janego, if I may take you wet back to the very beginning, would you in the law library find cases of people who had gone to trial, been charged with killing their parents, claimed sexual abuse as a defense, and have been acquitted? No, you would not. Thank you. I have nothing further. Anything else? Yeah, yeah. All right. Thank you. Ms. Lipton, you're excused. Thank you. Uh, your next witness? Uh, is Kim Custer. <laughs> I'll go down. Kim Custer. All right. If that, any of the uh, blue jurors want to come in, we can let them in at this point as well. Sure. 
All right, if you would step forward, sir, and uh, there's some people behind you who want to get through as well. All right, just stay, move in here a little bit and let people go by. All right, would you raise your right hand, please? Could you solemnly swear that your testimony may give in the cause of the before this court to be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Yes, ma'am. Please take the stand and state the name of the record. Uh, Timothy Custer. C U S T E R. Mr. Custer, do you know Lau Menendez, who's seated here to my right? Yes, ma'am. And how is it that you came to know him? Uh, I do some ministering at the county jail, and uh, I went one Sunday um, and took some Bibles for him and his brother uh, to visit. And have you done that before in, in other jail-type facilities where you go and see people who are locked up and talk to them about religion? Yes, ma'am. And did you make visits of that nature to both La Menendez and his brother Eric on yes. a number of occasions? Yes, ma'am. Did you, during the course of your visiting with Lyle and his brother Eric, come to know a woman named Jamie Pisarsik? Yes, ma'am. And what was her relationship? Uh, Lyle's girlfriend. Were you there when, in the fall of 1990, when something unusual happened? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And what was that? Uh, it was... Um, <clears throat> The day after she had received the ring that Lyle had given her. The engagement when, ring? Yes, ma'am. And did you know Miss Pizarsic well enough to talk to her at that time? Oh, yes. She knew me by name. Yes, ma'am. Now, were you actually in the visiting area when she and Lyle discussed the ring or the engagement, or did you have a conversation with her after she came out? After she came out, I was waiting out in the waiting room. Okay. And what did she say to you? How did she seem? Let me start with that. Uh, she was real happy, joyous. You know, Joe Bale, she was showing the ring and told me that Lyle had uh, proposed to her. And uh, she was just real happy and she said, and everyone was laughing. I believe her mother was there. She was like behind her or, you know, a side of her or something. And she said that Lyle had uh, proposed to her and he'd gotten down on his knees uh, behind the petition there where you visit them. And uh, she was, you know, laughing about it because she said some of the inmates were teasing him about it because it's something that doesn't happen every day, so. And did she seem happy about it? Yes. Thank you. Yeah, she was real excited. I have nothing further. Cross-examination? No, thank you. All right, thank you, sir. You may sit down. You're excused. And who is the next witness? The next. It would be before both juries, yeah. Your Honor, and oh. it depends on who's out there. Okay, why don't you see if, uh, let's also check on our jurors and see if we have all our blue jurors back. Can I check on my co-host? Yeah, yes, and we'll have the uh, bailiff check on our jurors. All right, do we have any blue jurors outside? Okay. All right, let's take a recess then and let everybody get back in here. We have some blue jurors who have yet to return. So we'll take a recess and we'll resume at a quarter to three. Ladies and gentlemen, don't discuss it with anyone. Don't form any final opinions about this case. And we'll resume at a quarter to three. You may call your next witness. Thank you, Your Honor. We would call Mr. Peckins. Step forward, sir. My name is Les Peckins. P E C K I N S. All right, you may examine the witness. Thank you, Your Honor. Mr. Peckins, what is your occupation? Uh, I am a part owner of a company called Habeas Copies, which is a litigation support company. 
Uh, and as part of your business, do you uh, provide services for lawyers who are in trial and uh, need various graphic displays and other items? I do for lawyers, law firms, and the courts. Okay. And uh, have you, uh, are you familiar with a video that has been marked Exhibit 402 and which is presently in the uh, video player that you have in front of you? I am. Okay, and have you seen that video before? I have. Okay. Uh, did you, in fact, cause the video to be made? I did. Uh, did you uh, work the camera yourself, or did you have somebody else do that? No, I had a camera person with me. Okay. Were you present at the time the camera person shot the video? I was. And uh, you are familiar with the contents of the video, is that I correct? I am, yes. Uh, did you, in essence, direct uh, the video? You might say that, yes. Okay. Now, I'm also going to ask you to look at an exhibit that's been previously marked as 200. Uh, do you recognize that exhibit? It's up on the board. Yes, I do. And did you, in fact, prepare that exhibit? I did. Uh, is that exhibit a, uh, a blow-up of certain documents you received from the city of Beverly Hills? It is. And uh, is that um, a map of the... Uh, roughly 700 block of Elm Drive and Maple Drive in Beverly Hills. Yes, it is. Uh, does uh, the exhibit that's been marked 200 depict some of the places that we will that you shot in the video? Yes. Okay. Uh, do you have a control that would enable you to play the video now? Yes, I do. All right, yeah, if anybody in front of the jurors there, that would be a good idea. Um, it is You're probably wondering why they didn't do that about three or four months ago. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, you may proceed. Thank you. Would you uh, press the play button, please? Oh, okay, fine. Okay, could we press pause for a minute, Mr. Peckins, while our juror... Okay. Everyone see pretty much? Okay. Let, let me ask you before uh, we, we begin, uh, does this video begin with, a, with uh, a northbound trip on Elm Drive? It does. Okay. Could you play the video? <laughs> May I approach your honor? All right. Do you have some new batteries? <laughs> I don't know how much help I can be. <laughs> it's on a float. Doesn't seem to want to move. Yeah. <clears throat> oh, maybe? Ah. Oh, okay. of course. You have to press the pause button again. <laughs> Could you press stop now? Or pause, thank you. Um, Mr. Peckins, <clears throat> uh, we've just seen a uh, drive northbound on Elm Drive in Beverly Hills, is that yes. correct? Is that uh, on the same side of the street as 722 North Elm Drive? Yes, it yes. is. In fact, you've stopped the video just as uh, you are approaching 722 North Elm Drive, is that That's correct? right. And that is, appears to be a white house with some greenish colored gates in front of it? Yes. Okay, could you back up the video just a little bit? Okay, that's fine. And now start it. There appears to be um, a house that has a blue Rolls Royce or Bentley, some fancy type car. 
I you believe I believe it was a Rolls. Okay. And is that car parked in the driveway of the property immediately next to 722 North Elm Drive? It is. All right. Could you stop the video now? Uh, is okay. I think we have to go back a little bit. I'm looking for the house that is just north of, Elm, of 722 North Elm. Okay. Is oops. <laughs> Okay, now back just a little bit more. Hmm. It's acting up today. All right. Is that the house? It seems. <laughs> Was that the house just north <laughs> of 722 North Elm? It was. Okay. <laughs> and I, I'm going to try and ask you one more time if you can back up and show the jury the relationship between the, the house to the north of 722 and 722, if you can, if the machine will cooperate. I guess it's not going to. I'm pressing rewind, and it doesn't seem to want to do that. Okay, let's stop right there. Uh, is that a close-up of the front door of 722 North Elm Drive? It is. Okay, and you can, can you see, in fact, that the front door in that close-up? Yes, the brownish color uh, through the trees. Is and where were you standing, Mr. Peckins, when uh, that particular shot was made? Uh, just about in the middle of the uh, the thoroughfare, in the middle of the street. In the middle of the street. So yeah. that that is what can be seen from, in fact, the middle of the street. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. And um, could you give us an, an estimate or approximation of the distance between the actual front door of the residence and the sidewalk in front of 722 North Elm? Oh, I would say... Uh, Approximately 20 yards. Okay. And could you, um, well, let's continue with the video and then I'll ask you. Now, Right now, are you kind of circling around with the camera starting at 722 North Elm and then going in a circle? No, we are starting across the street oh. from 722 and panning 360 degrees, and you'll see we'll go by 722 right there. In fact, and, there's the and uh, continue, Royce, right? Yes, and continue panning around. Okay, could you stop the uh, video there? Uh, there is now on the screen a house with some pillars. Is that correct? Yes. Um, is that a house at 718 North Elm Drive? It is. Uh, directing your attention to Exhibit 200, uh, which is the map, uh, can you see uh, 718 North Elm Drive on that map? Oh, can I? Yes. yes. Yeah, I'm okay. sorry, yes. And it, in fact, is that, does it appear to have the word Crom, K-R-O-M, written on it, 718? It does, yes. Now, 718 is a house that is too, uh, it, it's, there's a house in between 718 and 722 North Elm, is that That's correct? That's right, yes. And uh, that is the house that has the uh, bluish colored Rolls Royce in the driveway, is that correct? The house in between the two, yes. Yes, okay. Could you um, play the video again, please?
All right, let's stop the video now. Um, where is that shot taken from? This is um, hmm. hmm. May I, Your Honor? This is really very bulky. It doesn't want to uh, obey. It just doesn't, huh? No, it just doesn't want to obey. Well, I guess maybe it's we're not hitting the eye or something. I okay, should be aiming it at the uh, yeah. at the VCR rather than at the. Uh, Okay, we just had a shot of an alley, right? Yes. Where is that alley? That is behind uh, 722 and, and all of those houses there. There is a, a narrow alley, a public thoroughfare that runs okay. behind those houses. Miss Lansing is going to assist us. Not with the machine. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Um, now that, that is, you, we just saw a shot of an alley directly behind 724 North Elms Drive, is that correct? Yes. Okay, and Ms. Lansing, could you see if you could find that on the... 724. Right, okay, so that would be the alley directly behind. Also, right. Ms. Lansing, would you point out the 718 again, the Chrome residence, which is one with the pillars? Thank you. All right, let's... Menendez. Men <coughs> Menendez says Menendez, okay. All right, now what do we have on the TV screen now, Mr. Pegas? This is directly behind 722. Uh, and although I can't see, and my best guess would be that it's a, a lighted tennis court. Uh, okay, so 722 North Elm has a tennis court as well? Uh, it, as I say, I could not see in. But I saw the uh, the lights and and the house at the beginning of that street has a lighted tennis court uh, in the, in much the same area, and so I just surmise that that's uh, that's what that is. Okay, let's see if we can get the video to play. Okay. And uh, it, we're now showing houses which are, are in the alley in the vicinity of the rear of 722 North Elm Drive, is that correct? Yes, on the other side, and not, but this is now back on the same side. Let's back up for a minute if, if we can. Okay, is this, it, let's, whoops, stop and we'll go forward. I'm trying to get to the back, the, the guest house at 724 North Elm Drive. Okay, you, uh, in fact, appear in the video pointing at uh, a, a building, is that correct? Yes. Is that the guest house at 722 North Elm Drive? I believe that's what it is. It is a, an outbuilding. Okay. Which, uh, and that is, that is a building which uh, is d directly on the alleyway? Yes. Is that correct? Perhaps that's Ms. correct. Perhaps Ms. Lansing can locate that building on, the, on Exhibit 200. Would that be the approximate location of yes. that building? Yes. Okay. All right, let's play the video. That appears to be a two-story building, is that That's right. accurate? All right, let's stop. Um, we have part of the two-story building at the rear of 724 North Elm Drive, and there is a tennis court directly to the right of that. Yes. Uh, is, is there appears to be a walkway uh, that is also pictured to in the middle of the uh, television screen? Yes, but it's impossible to see in there. So I, I suspect that's what it is. Okay, and is, is this um, a walkway which goes to the property at 724 North Elm Drive? It's 724? Yes. No, that that's, on the, that's on the side of... That's a different one. That's a yes. Okay. That's on the side of 722. Right. Let's continue with the video. All right, is there another walkway shown there? 
Yes. Where is that walkway? That's on the side of 724. And is that a walkway that leads into the property at 724 North Elm Drive? It, it, would, it would appear so, but again, the foliage is very heavy there, and so it was very difficult to see. Is Miss Lansing pointing to the approximate place on the, uh, the map where that walkway is? Oh, I'm sorry. You're talking about 724. No, this, yes. this is between 722 and 720. This is on the other side. Okay, okay. All right, let's continue with the video. So th what, what we're looking at now is the actual property line, really, between 720 and 720, 722 and 720. Is that correct? That's correct. Are, they, are, the, houses fairly, are the properties fairly close to, together at that point? They are. So we're show, that previous scene shows the gate from the 720 property and the guest house on the 724. That's right. Now what are we looking at, Mr. President? This is on the other side. This is the, seven, this is the 724 side. Okay. Now what is seen in the uh, video now? That's the roof and the top story of, of 722. Okay. And this is along the, the side street uh, to the north. And that is another shot of 722? This shot is 724 in Seven. the left-hand corner there. Okay, let's. It's 724, let's, the upper story of 724. Let's stop it there. Where you can see the white tile house is 722, correct? Oops, I'm sorry, I pressed the wrong button. Okay. At least they're responding. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> let's uh, let's move. Okay. okay. So that's 724 okay. on your left-hand side. On the left-hand side. Yes. Okay, and that shows the relationship between 724 and the house next door, correct? That's, that's right. Okay, could you continue with the video? And could you stop it? Can you see in that video, uh, actually in the background, the actual house at 724? Mm-hmm. The, in the background is the house at 722, and the foreground is the house at 724. Okay. And approximately how, how close are the houses together at that point? <sighs> Difficult to say precisely, but I would say uh, it looked to me like about 10 or 15 feet. Okay. All right, let's continue, if you will. <coughs> All right, now we're back at the front of 722 North Elm. That's correct? right. Um, Mr. Peckins, when I asked you about the, the distance uh, from the front door uh, to the street, um, from the front door of 722 to, to the street, you estimated 20 yards. Now, that's about 60 feet. Mm. Is that uh, accurate? I, th I think I said 15 to 20 yards. Uh, it, it's perhaps a little a little less than that. Uh, perhaps it might be it might be uh, uh, as, as few as ten. Okay, in, in any but event, somewhere somewhere in that general vicinity. In any event, that's a, that that is a measurement taken when you're standing in the middle of the street, correct? Yes. As opposed to on the sidewalk. Yes. All right. Thank you. I have nothing further at this time. All right. Uh, any other examination by uh, other counsel? All right, thank you, sir. You may thank sit you. down. <clears throat> You're excused. Um, your next witness. My next witness is uh, Cynthia Erdley. Okay. Has that tape recording been marked as an exhibit? Yes, it has, Your Honor. And the exhibit number? 402. Thank <laughs> you. 
Okay. Your Honor, should we move this now? Move it out? Yeah, if you could. Okay. Cynthia Erdely, E R D E L Y I. Uh, Ms. Erdley, you've previously testified and identified yourself as an investigator for the defense in this case, is that right? Yes. As part of your duties in um, investigating this case, did you contact and interview a person named Grant Walker? Yes. And on how many different occasions did you interview Mr. Walker? Three. And do you remember the dates of your interviews with him? August 19th, 1993, September 9th, 1993, and November 22nd, 1993. Now, with respect to your interviews of August 19th, 1993, and September 9th, 1993, were those conducted before he testified? Yes. And the last interview on November 22nd, was that after he testified? Yes. With respect to the first two interviews before he testified, did he ever mention to you in the course of those interviews that he had told Leon Bartek anything about having seen the Menendez brothers playing tennis at their home? No. And with respect to that earlier, in the earliest interview on August 19th, during that interview, did he tell you that, uh, did he, did he state to you that he had called the Beverly Hills Police Department the Wednesday after the killings and talked to a desk officer who took his name? Yes. Now, did you also, in the, um, when you spoke to Mr. Walker on, a, on November 22nd, did you ask him for the names of the three people who he claimed to have serviced pools for on Saturday, August 19th? Yes. And what three names did he give you? Ann Ingram, Mr. and Mrs. Chin, and Virginia Valdry. Now, did you locate the Chin residence? Yes. Without giving us the address, was it on was it in the 400 North Block of Lucerne? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry, I need to look at my report. Okay, it was on Lucerne, correct? On Lucerne, right. It was on the 500 South yeah, Block, wasn't it? Sustained. Right. Look at your report. <sighs> okay, my report indicates the 500 Block. Okay, South? Correct. Okay. Uh, in fact, did any of the three families, Valdre, Ingram, or Chin, reside in the 400 North Block of Lucerne? No. Now, you, um, you interviewed Mrs. Valdre, did you not? Yes. On how many occasions did you interview her? One interview and two follow-up calls. And what was the date of the formal interview? Uh, Monday, November 29th, 1993. Now, this is Mrs. Valdry, okay? Correct. All right. And uh, did you uh, ask Mrs. Valdry if indeed Mr. Uh, Walker serviced her pool on Saturday, August 19th, 1989? Yes. And what did she tell you? Her answer was that he did not start working on Saturdays until two and a half or three years ago. And uh, did you, in talking to her, pin down the earliest time it could have been that he started working on Saturdays? Yes. And what was that time, according to her? Approximately three years ago, or approximately November or fall of 1990. Now, when you, um, strike that, did Mrs. Valdry ever tell you that Mr. Walker before, well, strike that, did Mrs. Valdry tell you what day of the week Mr. Walker worked for her before he started on Saturdays? Yes. And what did she tell you? Her recollection was that it was a weekday, but she could not name the specific day of the week. Was it the same weekday, though, each week until he switched to Saturdays? I recall asking her if that weekday varied, and her answer was no. So it was the same weekday until it became Saturdays? As far as I understood from her, yes. 
Now, did she ever tell you that he only worked a weekday um, in order to uh, get the chlorine level right in the pool and then he switched to Saturdays? <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't understand the question. Okay. Did she say to you, oh, he only worked week, weekdays at the very beginning until he got the chlorine level in the pool stabilized? Not to me, no. Now, she did tell you that he, uh, <coughs> he started to work for her in 1987, correct? Correct. And the, is it true that the, based on the information she gave you, the impression she gave you was that he worked on a weekday for three years until he switched to Saturdays? That was my understanding, yes. Now, after you interviewed uh, Mrs. Valdre, did you uh, ask her if she would voluntarily come to court? Yes, I did. And at first, did she agree to do that? Yes. And then what happened? Monday evening after I last talked to her and asked if she needed directions or transportation. It reflects the witness's state of mind, Your Honor. Her statements are not being made, offered for the truth of them. Which witness is state of mind? Mrs. Valdry's. He has to. Well, let me see it's sidebar. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, Ms. Ridley, you were telling us that you had a conversation with uh, Mrs. Valdry. Was this the night before she was supposed to come to court? Correct. And uh, what did she indicate to you that night before she was supposed to come to court? That she would still be coming in voluntarily. And did, was she requiring transportation be provided to her? No. All right. Now, to, uh, did you then discover subsequently that she had failed or was refusing to come to court voluntarily? Yes. And uh, did you then cause a subpoena to be served on her to require her attendance in court? Yes. And uh, did you uh, have contact with her after the service of the subpoena? Not telephonically, not until I saw her again here in court. Okay, and was she happy about having been served with a subpoena and being forced to come to court? No. In fact, was she angry? Yes. <coughs> All right, the answer is stricken. Did she express anger to you? Yes. And in fact, even after she was subpoenaed, did she call and indicate that she wasn't going to come? Yes. And was she told that if she didn't come, a warrant would be sought? N not from me, no. I didn't have that conversation with her. To your knowledge, did one of the other investigators have that conversation with her at my direction? Sustain. Were you, did you communicate to another investigator working for the defense that she should be admonished that she had to come? Sustain. Did she show up after? Um, well, first of all, did you report to me that she that she was threatening not to come, even though she was subpoenaed? Sustained. Objection sustained. Did you see Mrs. Uh, Valdry after the time when she indicated she didn't want to come to court after she was subpoenaed? Yes. Was she angry? Yes. Now, did you interview Leon Bartek? Yes. And uh, do you recall when it was that you interviewed him? September 1st and September 9th, 1993. Now, did you talk to Mr. Bartek about when it was that he discovered that the spa controls at the Menendez home were being overridden by the pool controls? Yes, I did. And did he indicate to you that he may have made that discovery two Wednesdays before the killings? Yes, he did. And did he tell you what day of the week it was that he serviced the Menendez pool in 1989? Yes. And what day did he say it was? Wednesday. Did he ever tell you that it was Mondays and Thursdays? No. Now, did Mr. Bartek, in the two times that you interviewed him, ever indicate to you that Mr. Walker had told Mr. Bartek that Mr. Walker claimed to have seen the Menendez brothers playing tennis at the house? No. And did you talk to Mr. Bartek about Mr. Walker? Yes. And did you ask Mr. Bartek if he had any kind of documentation whatsoever uh, to indicate that Mr. Walker had done work at the Menendez house or was paid for work at the Menendez house? Yes. And did he ever produce any checks for you? No. 
Your Honor, I believe the people want to be heard on the next um, topic. All right. Um, is there any further examination of this witness on any other matter? Uh, not in front juries? of both juries. There's All right. some for the blue jury. All right. Is there any cross examination as of this point? Yes, sir. Okay. You may conduct that examination. Really? <clears throat> You're the same uh, investigator who did the, uh, the tape of the after crime uh, escapades? Yes. Your escapades, Your Honor, I object to the form of the question, and this is beyond the scope of this direct. All right. Uh, the objection is sustained as to the form of the question, but as far as establishing uh, other work she's done, uh, that question is a, would be permissible in a different form. Thank you, Your Honor. Ms. Early, Early, you testified earlier before the jury about you're retracing the route taken after the, these men, these defendants, killed their parents, correct? Yes. And do you recall uh, being told that Lyle Menendez had said that he and his brother waited around about five to ten minutes after the killings? Sustained. Objection sustained. It is beyond the scope. We have next question, please. Certainly, you had the reports from Detective Zoller regarding his interviews with Grant Walker and Leon Bartek. Is that correct? Objection, Your Honor. There's no interview from you about Leon Bartek. Objection you give, overall. You were given information and a report taken of an interview with Grant Walker, correct? Yes. Did you write any reports in this case Objection, or any of the Your interviews Honor? that you uh, have testified Honor, to here? This is improper. Objection overruled. You may answer, ma'am. Yes. Have you made those reports available to the I'd prosecution? Like to approach, Your Honor. Right, rephrase the question. No, I'd still like to. No, it, no, just rephrase the question. Now, you appear to be testifying. Is it from memory today, ma'am? Yes. You don't have a report in front of you? Yes. You do? Both, yes. Where is that report? In my lap. Now, is that a report of your interview with Grant Walker? Yes. Is, it your, this is, improper is there another report of an interview Church with Leon Bartek? Yes. Do you have a report from an interview of uh, Mrs. Valdry? Yes. Okay. And you've refer referred to those reports in your testimony today? Yes. Your Honor, may I approach? Well, I'm going to object her. It's improper. All right. You can uh, state your objection at the sidebar here if you like. All right, we have both juries back, and let's resume with the examination. We'll go back to further direct examination of this witness uh, before the cross-examination continues. Okay. Uh, Ms. Irwin, when you spoke to Grant Walker on November 22nd, 1993, uh, did you ask him uh, about whether or not, uh, prior to his testifying, he had called in to a radio talk show to talk about this case? Yes. And uh, what did he tell you when you asked him if he had done that? He said yes, he had. And uh, would he tell you when it was that he had called into the radio talk show? No, he couldn't recall. Now, do you uh, recall um, his testifying that he really didn't want to get involved in this case? Right, that's argumentative, and let's not uh, repeat testimony. If I may approach your honor. Yes. This will be Exhibit 403. Yes, we will stipulate that Exhibit 403 is from the Michael Jackson talk radio show from August the 6th of 1993. Is that correct? That's correct. And it's somewhere between 12 noon and 1 p.m. I hope this is cute, right? So. Loud enough. Fred, you're on 790K ABC Talk Radio with the nationally prominent criminal defense lawyer Barry Tarlow and Michael Jackson. Hi, Fred. Yes, Michael. Yes, sir. Yes, I uh, I happen to be a repairman that was uh, at the Mendezes on the Saturday. Well, they were killed Sunday, weren't they? Right. And I remember, and I talked to the detective, I remember the parents were there with the two boys doing tennis. And the boys were very disrespectful to their parents. It wasn't the parents at all saying anything negative to the children. You mean loud mouth, brood, what? Right. I remember the, uh, Eric, he was having a fit because he missed a shot. So he, uh, 
on the tennis court. kind of foul language. And I remember as I was walking by, yeah. instantly stopped his, his vulgarity and turned to me and said, hi, how are you doing? And I thought that was unusual to be able to do that. What were you repairing? I was a pool repairman. Oh, pool. Oh, okay. Um, so you'd seen them before? This was the first time I'd seen them. Hmm. And they were sufficiently rude to their parents that it made a mark on you? Yes. I remember coming home and telling my wife. I thought it was very unusual. Yeah. How kind of you to tell us. Thank you very much indeed. Okay. All right. <laughs> Certainly, had you asked Mr. Walker uh, when it was that he was calls into the radio show? Yes. Did you tell him you were going to try to locate the uh, tape of his call? No. And would he tell you when he called in? No, he could never recall when it happened. Is that what he told you? Yes. Did you ask him if it was before the trial had begun or after the trial had commenced? Yes, I did. And uh, could he tell you if it was before or after? No. And did you ask him, was it before you spoke to the detectives or after? Yes. And would he answer that? He couldn't recall. I have nothing further. All right, cross-examination. Do you have a report from that interview now? Pardon me? Do you have a report from the November 22nd interview that you had with uh, Grant Walker? Yes. Did you write that down somewhere? Did I write it down somewhere? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Uh, would you care to share that with me? Well, Your Honor, I'm going to object to this on the same grounds as before. And there's no Objection over all. I don't have that before. All right. Well, the witness, do you have it? Yes. Okay. okay. May I approach, Your Honor? Yes. These are two. Don't Ma'am, you've indicated that you talked to Mr. Walker on the 22nd of November, correct? Correct. And when you spoke to him, did he volunteer the information that he had called up the Michael Jackson uh, talk radio show? No. Had you known that previously? Yes. How did you know that? I had been informed of that by Lena Starkman at Leslie Abramson's office. May I have the report, please? This is a report of the interview of uh, Mr. Walker? Correct. Dated November 22nd. Well, I'm up here, is there any other ones? Okay, let's go back uh, to the podium and continue your examination. Uh, counsel's remark uh, regarding her objection is uh, stricken from the record. Let's proceed. Now, Mr. Walker indicated to you that he had called the Michael Jackson talk radio show, correct? Yes. And you've, you've heard uh, what he said on that radio show? Yes. That's consistent with how he testified, correct? Sustained. Now, he told you on an earlier interview, I believe it was uh, September 9th of 93, is that correct? Objection to the that a question? He said, is that correct? So I assume he means it to be a question. Yes, did you understand it? No, I did not. Okay. Let's, let's just get this straight. You've talked to Grant Walker three times, is that correct? Correct. August 19th? Correct. And was that just a telephonic? No. September 9th? Correct. And November 22nd? Correct. Regarding the November 22nd interview, did he tell you that he used a, a different name? He didn't use his own name when he called in? I didn't discuss that with him. Have you learned that he used a, a different name when he called the uh, KABC? Objection, Your Honor, calls for hearsay. Sustained. On Thursday, 
August 19, 1993, you had an interview with uh, Mr. Walker, correct? I'm sorry, I can't hear you. On August 19, 1993, you had an interview with Mr. Walker. Correct. And on that day, he told you that he had been to the Menendez house on August 19, 1989, exactly four years earlier, correct? Yes. And he told you that he saw what appeared to be a tennis instructor with Lyle on the court. Is that correct? Yes. And that Eric was standing by his parents with a tennis racket in his hand wearing tennis clothes, correct? Yes. And that the instructor was on the court near the alley volleying with Lyle, correct? Yes. And he told you that after this Saturday, it made such an impression that when he got home, he told his wife that these boys were disrespectful to their parents. Isn't that correct? Yes. <coughs> Did he tell you why he called into KABC Talk Radio? No. Now, on September 9th, 1993, you had another interview with him, correct? Yes. And he told you that he definitely recalled being there on the Saturday before the killings, correct? Yes. He was emphatic that he saw the news of the murders on Monday and remembered being there on Saturday right away. That's what he told you, correct? Yes. He told you that he also told his wife about it when he got home on Saturday, correct? Yes. Now, you've also testified to a Leon Bartek interview. And correct? I, I Is that right, Ms. Early? Yes. And you interviewed Leon Bartek on September 1st? Correct. Now, did you also interview him on September 9th? I'm going to object and ask the years you stated before you left. Yes. Yes. September 1st, 1993. Is that yes. And this is after you had gotten the information um, regarding Grant Walker. Is that right? Yes. Now, you also, I believe, indicated that you interviewed him again on September 9th. Is that right? Yes. Was that a telephonic? Yes. And were there notes from that? Yes. In addition to September 1st, you have something else. Is that right? Yes. May I approach on it? Let's just continue here. Okay. Now, Mr. Bartek indicated to you on September 1st, 1993, that he was there the Wednesday before the murders, correct? That was one of his statements, yes. Did you at some point say, you sure you didn't find out about this uh, problem with the, the heater a couple of Wednesdays before the killings? Did you make that statement to him? I asked him as much as I possibly could about his recollection. And did you question him as to whether he was sure that it was a Wednesday before the killings that this uh, uh, heater problem was detected? I don't know that I used those exact words, but that would be fair to say. And at some point he said, well, it may have been two Wednesdays before? That was my understanding. Okay, but he had told you initially he believed it was the Wednesday before the killings, correct? Correct. Now, you've also testified as to Virginia Valtry. Yes. And I believe your testimony was that on Monday she was upset with you. Was that what you testified to, ma'am? Not on Monday, no. When was it that she became upset with you? Tuesday. No, I believe that date would be November 30th. Okay. When is the first time you spoke to Mrs. Valjean? Monday, November 29th. Now, when you spoke to Mrs. Valjean, did you, did you tape the conversation? No. Did you take notes and then write a report from the notes, or did you just simply uh, get back to your office and, and write or type up a report? I took notes. Your Honor, may I approach? No, let's just finish it off here. Okay. 
Now, you said that on Tuesday she was upset with you, correct? Correct. Now, isn't it true that your own report on Tuesday, November 30th, 1993, when you left, you said that she was cooperative? Your Honor, I think the question is confusing as to whether the report is for Tuesday or for Monday. All right, why don't you clarify that? Yes. Do you have the report uh, that I now have dated Tuesday, November 30th, 1993, regarding the statement of Virginia Valdry? Yeah. Yes. And if you would look at the last line of the first page, you make a statement. She just returned from out of town yesterday. She was cooperative. Correct? Correct. Now, this report you wrote after you had talked to Mrs. Valdry on Tuesday, November 30th, 1993, correct? I should look at a calendar to see what dates Monday and Tuesday were. I may have made a typo. Calendar is right over here on the wall. Tuesday was November 30th, correct? Correct. And you never state you stated that she was cooperative. You never said she was angry at when you wrote this report. That was during our initial interview. Let's get this clear. You have this report dated Tuesday, November 30th, 1993, correct? Correct. You state that uh, she had just returned from out of town and she was cooperative, correct? C correct. Now, you're, you've testified that Mrs. Valdry was angry <coughs> on Tuesday, November 30th, 1993 with you. The following morning after our interview, yes. So it wasn't Tuesday that she was angry at you? I've just stated I probably made a typo on typing the date. When did you subpoena her? I did not. Another investigator did. When was it that you first spoke to her? I know I spoke to her on, on one day, and then the problem started the next day. It, it must have been Tuesday then. That you spoke and then Wednesday the problems started. I'm sorry. So you were, you were wrong with the dates on that? Correct. OK. When you testified to that fact, uh, what were you relying on? My memory. Did you look at your notes? <coughs> Do I look at my notes? Did you prior to making your... I had testimony? looked at my report, yes. Did you look at uh, your notes before um, testifying here today? No. You did not? No. Did you personally have... Um, a conversation with Mrs. Valdry after Tuesday, November 30th, 1993, you personally? Just the following morning. And the nature of that conversation was uh, she was to come in to testify? Correct. And what seemed to be the problem? All she stated was she didn't wish to be involved. And she came in today, correct? Yes. And did you provide transportation for her? No. She came in voluntarily. Jackson, you're on this day. Is that correct? Do you know why she came in? Yes. Why'd she come in? She was subpoenaed. 
and she took the stand and she took an oath to tell the truth and she testified here. Your Honor, maybe I should approach on this. I, I don't have anything at this point, but I would like to take a look at something. Okay, Ms. Early, I just want to make the record straight. Is it now your testimony that you first interviewed Mrs. Valdre on Tuesday, November 30th? Yes. I, for some reason, Mondays and Tuesdays are... It's all right. You're allowed to make mistakes, but it's nice if you'll admit it. Did you make a mistake when you testified before? Yes. All right. So you interviewed her on the Tuesday, and she said she'd come to court. She was cooperative. She said she'd be here on the Wednesday. So stay. Did she say she'd be here on the Wednesday? Yes. And do you recall that at about lunchtime on Wednesday, uh, you called and left an urgent message here at the court? Objection. Calls I'm asking what the message was. Overall, you can answer the question yes or no. Yes. And did I return your call? Yes. And at that time, did you tell me Mrs. Valdre wasn't coming in voluntarily? Objection. Calls did you know by that time on Wednesday that Mrs. Valdry had you already spoken to her and had she already refused to come in? Correct. And subsequent to that, yesterday, Thursday, did Mrs. Valdry show up in the afternoon? Yes. And was it then and did you see her? Yes. And did you talk to her? Yes. And was it then that you determined that she was angry about having been subpoenaed? That was her demeanor, yes. Objection calls for speculation. No Overall, the answer was stay. Now, you said that you um, spoke to Mr. Walker about the KBC talk radio call after you received information from Lena Starkman from my office. Is that Correct. Right? And did you receive the information from Mrs. Starkman after Mr. Walker had testified? Yes. And was it your understanding that someone had contacted my office concerning KABC Talk Radio? Yes. After Mr. Walker testified? Yes. I have nothing further. Anything else? No, just very briefly. Ma'am, when you went to talk to um, Grant Walker after he testified in this court. Objection, Your Honor. Assumes facts, not in evidence. Overall. When you went to talk to Grant Walker after he testified in this court, ma'am, did he voluntarily give you names of uh, certain uh, customers that he had? Objection, Your Honor. Beyond the scope. Overall, you can ask that yes or no. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Nothing further. All right. Anything else? The names he gave you were the same uh, three people we're talking about, right? Valdre, Chin, and Ingram. Correct. Nothing further. All right. Uh, you may step down. You're not excused. Uh, you may call your next witness before both juries. All right. Detective Zoller, on August 22nd, 1989, did you interview Marzi Eisenberg? Yes. And in the course of that interview, in describing Jose Menendez, did she tell you he was a tough businessman, he liked a good fight in the boardroom? Yes. Did, he, did she tell you he was very stern and had a way about him of revealing people's shortcomings? Yes, he did. Yes, she did. I'm sorry. Did she tell you that he, meaning Jose Menendez, like in his business dealings, ran a tight ship? He ran the family. Yes. Did she also tell you that uh, 
she spoke to Kitty Menendez by phone often, but was not close to her. Yes. Yes, I did. All right. Was the first interview? Um, I'm sorry. Was the first interview on June um, 2nd, 1993? The first of the 1993 interviews. I don't recall specifically, but if you have a date there, I'll rely on that. Okay. Let me show you. The Yes, that's correct. Okay. Let me just show you this. this is yes. Okay. And uh, during the course of the interview with Karen Farrell on June 2nd, 1993, did she tell you uh, that she had lunch with uh, Kitty Menendez the Wednesday before she died? Yes, she did. And did you have another interview with um, Karen Farrell on October 25th, 1993? Yes. And did she tell you again in that interview that she last saw Kitty on Wednesday, August 16th, 1989? Yes, she did. And in the interview of October 25th, 1993, did Mrs. Farrell tell you that on Saturday, August 19th, 1989, she phoned Kitty and told Kitty that uh, she, Mrs. Farrell, and her husband we're planning to spend Sunday in Santa Barbara. Yes. Now you also interviewed Grant Walker. Is that correct? That's correct. And. Uh, you recall when Mr. Walker testified, he claimed that he got the names of the brothers wrong and he switched which brother was doing with various things. Objection irrelevant when he was possible to that. Oh, right. You're asking about his testimony or when he was speaking with the Secretary Zohar? Uh, <coughs> you were present for his testimony, were you not? That's correct. All right. Just sit down for a second. First of all, when you uh, interviewed Grant Walker, was that on July 25th, 1993? Yes. Was that the first time you interviewed him? Yes, it was. And did you first uh, learn of his existence on July 21st, 1993? Or approximately the 21st, that's correct. Okay. And on the 25th of July, 1993, um, did he tell you that he had been watching the news in reference to the Lyle and Eric Menendez murder trial, where the defense is claiming self-defense. He indicated to me, I'm not sure watching the news is a proper character characterization of what he said. But that he, his correct. reference was to the news. But you wrote the word watching That's in your correct. report. And uh, do you think you wrote it? That, I mean, did you just make the word up, or was that uh, based on what he was telling us? It was my impression. I don't recall the word watching. It was my impression it, was, it had come from the news media. Okay. Well, did you ask him specifically, was he watching the trial? I did not ask him. Did you know that his, wa <coughs> his wife watched court TV every day? Objection calls for hearsay. Sustained. 
Did he tell you that his wife was watching the transmissions and <coughs> taping it? So objection calls for hearsay. Overruled. No. Were you present in the courthouse corridor uh, after Mr. Walker testified? At which point? Immediately after he testified? Well, during the course of the day, did you observe him and his wife out in the hallway? Yes. Did you see his wife go over to Terry Moran, the commentator from Excuse Court me, TV? Excuse me, Honor, I object to this as being irrelevant as to what his wife did. Sustained. Did you see his wife combing his hair before he came back in to resume his testimony? Same objection, Your Honor. Overall. No, I didn't notice. <laughs> Did you um, ask Mr. Walker what specific news sources he had been exposed to uh, before he t contacted the police? He didn't contact the police, as to my <coughs> understanding. Mrs. Walker contacted the police. And I did not. Hearsay. Objection sustained to the question. The answer is straight. The question is before he spoke to you. Well, first of all, you went to his home, correct? That's correct. He let you in? Yes, he did. Was he cooperative? He was. Fine. And uh, here is someone who's telling you that he's been following the news somehow about a case that's in progress, correct? Yes. And he claims to have information for you, correct? That's correct. Now, did you have any concern about what the source of his information might be? Other than saying that it was the news, no. Well, did you ask him specifically what he had heard about the case from the news? Objection irrelevant. Overall, you can answer that question. No. Did you ask him if he had seen uh, any television coverage uh, that showed Eric and Lyle Menendez? I did not, no. <laughs> Excuse me, Your Honor. Did he tell you when you interviewed him on July 25th that he had repeated his observations to Mr. Leon Bartek? No. And in fact, Detective Zoller, after speaking to Mr. Uh, Walker, uh, did you contact Leon Bartek? Yes. And when was it that you contacted Mr. Bartek? <clears throat> Quite a while after I had spoken to Mr. Walker. It was after your investigator had contacted Mr. Bartek. And did you ever prepare a report of your contact with Mr. Bartek? No, I did not. Uh, do you recall Mr. Bartek testifying that Mr. Walker told Mr. Bartek that my, what Mr. Walker had observed was um, one of the sons in an argument with his father? Objection irrelevant, what he recalls. Sustained. It's only foundationally irrelevant. Well, let's get to the ultimate question. Did Mr. Bartek, before he testified, tell you that Mr. Walker had told him that he, Mr. Walker, had observed an argument between one of the sons and their father? No. Did you ever ask Mr. Bartek before he testified uh, whether or not Mr. Walker had ever told him the story of having seen the Menendez brothers? No, I did not. And I t uh, did Mr. Walker, before he testified, ever tell you that he had told his story to Mr. Bartek? No. Did he tell you, though, that he had told it to his wife? Yes, he did. 
And did he tell you that he told it to his wife because boys being vulgar to their parents was so shocking to him? Not an attic characterization, no. Do you know if the Walkers have children? Your Honor, that's irrelevant. Sustained. Did you inquire whether they had ever had contact with teenagers in their life? Objection, Sustain. argumentative. Sustain, it's irrelevant. When you spoke to Mr. Walker in July of 1993, did he tell you that one of the boys in particular was um, saying the rude things to the parent, or did he tell you it was both of them equally? He made an indication that it was both of them. Now, he testified, um, <coughs> strike that, before he testified, uh, did you or did anyone in your presence go over the police report with him? Objection irrelevant. Overall. Not to my knowledge. No one sat down with him before he testified and asked him if what you had written down was accurate? Not to my knowledge. Then you must have been surprised when he changed okay, his Okay, counsel, let's not ask these questions. Let's finish it off. Uh, did he tell you that um, it was Eric who was being rude on the tennis court to his uh, mother? May I look at a report, please? Oh, certainly. I think I have it in front of me if I Yours? may refer to it, yes. Write your next question, please. He did indicate uh, who it was in, independently. He did or didn't? Did not. Okay. He didn't say it was Eric and he didn't say it was Lyle. That's correct. And he didn't say it was the older one and he didn't say it was the younger one. That's correct. He simply said both of them. That's correct. I have nothing further. All right. Any examination by. Lyle Menendez counsel before both juries? Yeah, you're right. Any cross examination? No. All right, let me see counsel at the sidebar regarding our schedule here. All right, counsel, you have some stipulations? Yes, Council may be stipulated that Exhibit 372, two pages of records with the notation HRC are true and correct copies of the records of the Hair Replacement Corporation with regard to the hair piece for La Menendez. Stipulated. May be further stipulated that Exhibit 384 is a collection of documents which track the movement of the Menendez family between the 17th of March, 1989, and the end of that month. So stipulated as to the family members testified to. Yes. And may be further stipulated that Exhibit 392, a two-page undergraduate announcement from Princeton University indicating that spring recess was March 11th to March 19th is a true and accurate reflection of the spring break dates for that year. So stipulated. May it further be stipulated that Kitty Menendez's car was stolen March 25th, 1989. So stipulated. Thank you. 
All right, and uh, it's my understanding there's going to be some brief testimony for the gold jury, and uh, then we'll have some more brief testimony with the blue jury. And after the testimony with the gold jury, I'll be excusing you for the day. So um, I'd ask that the blue jurors go back into your jury room since you're closer here and just wait there a short period of time, and then I will have you come out. And then we'll be finished with our testimony in the case. The uh, blue jury has left and the old jury is still remaining. You may continue your examination of the Thank witness. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Detective Zolar, on November 2nd, 1993, did you interview Jamie Pisarsik? Yes. And do you have your report with you of that interview? I do. I'm sorry, for this question, I do need to Just for one question? One question. Well, I let's get to the rest of it then and come back to it, whatever else you have. Um, as, part of that, um, as part of that interview, did you discuss with her, or did she discuss with you, efforts to receive information <laughs> about whether Mr. Menendez had paid for a sponsorship for her? Yes. And did she produce a document uh, which indicated that she had received such information? Yes, she did. And was that document dated February 1990? That's correct. And did she indicate to you when it was that she sought information with regard to that issue? I believe so, yes. And can you tell me when it was she said that she sought that information? What prompted her to seek that information? Uh, information that she received in reference to the trial. Can you be more specific? What did she tell you? You can refer to your report if that's helpful. I, I don't recall any more uh, specifics than that. Um, Detective Zoller, does your report indicate Jamie said that after she heard during the trial that Mr. Menendez had paid for her sponsorship by using an anonymous name, she contacted Mr. Nell to ask him of the sponsorship for her play in Europe. Is that what your report reads? It does. And does that accurately reflect what Jamie Pizarsik told you on that day? Pretty much so, yes, in substance. So she indicated that she heard the information during the trial. Is that correct? That's what my understanding was, yes. And at that same interview, did she indicate to you where she was living at the time of La Menendez's arrest? Yes. And where did she say she was living? At the uh, Marina City Club apartments. And did she say she was living with him at the time? I believe so, yes. And that was contrary to her testimony here, is that Very correct? Sustained. Did she also discuss with you at that time buying books for Lyle Menendez? Yes. And did she talk about going to the Walden bookstore all the time and buying him books? That's correct. She did not indicate that she went to a number of different bookstores, is that correct? I think it's what she said is that she, she bought books for him all the time and specifically went to the Walden bookstore. Would it refresh your recollection to look at your report? No, I, I recall it. Did you, does your report say she said that she was going to the Walden bookstore all the time buying him books? That's correct. And she indicated just general subjects? Correct. And you were asking her specifically what types of books she bought, is that correct? That's correct. 
and the only specific she could give you was a book on sign language. Is that, that correct? That's correct. And she did not remember or mention to you November 2nd, 1993, anything about buying a book on the BBC? That's correct. Is that correct? Uh, Detective Zoller, during the course of this trial, did you observe Dr. Fairstein, a psychiatrist Excuse for me, the process? I would ask that this, this is irrelevant. Please take. Detective Zoller, you were here in the courtroom when a man who'd worked as a bodyguard briefly for Lau Menendez, named Winskowski, testified. Is that correct? That's correct. And you were here when an associate of Lau Menendez is Glenn Stevens testified. Is that correct? That's correct. Mr. Wenskowski was asked if when he came out here to testify, if you Your took... Your Honor, unobjective as a being improper, sir, rebuttal. Sustain. May I approach Your Honor? Yes. Thank you. You remember who Mr. Stevens was also, I believe? That's correct. Okay. And Detective, or um, Mr. Wenskowski, when he was being questioned by Mr. Burt, was asked if whether when he was out here to testify for the prosecution, you took him to a topless bar. Do you remember that question? I remember it. And Mr. Wenskowski said adamantly it never happened. He would have sustained. Indicated that it Well, let's not go rehash his testimony. Why don't you ask him, uh, the witness, what uh, well, the he recalls is, happening. Two witnesses have testified differently, and I wanted him to well, tell me. Well, again, you have to ask him directly what, what you want to ask him. Did you take Mr. Wenskowski and Mr. Stevens to a topless bar when they came out here to testify for the prosecution? Yes, I did. Thank you. I have one other question for both juries then, Your Honor. Your Honor, maybe it could be asked in front of this jury and then get them for the other sister. All right, let's do it that way. It's just one question, assuming it will be. When you interviewed Jamie Pisarsik about the conversation she claimed to have overheard or conversation she claimed to have had with Eric Menendez about Lyle Menendez's hairpiece, did she give you some details? Yes. And did you write those in your report? Yes. And can you tell us now how she described that conversation to you November 2nd, 1993? Now, which conversation are you referring to? This is the conversation with regard to Eric supposedly knowing that Lyle had a hairpiece. I'll preface it by saying I, when I asked her if anybody had known about the hairpiece, particularly uh, Eric, and she said yes, that he had found out in the spring of 1989. I tried to pin her down on a date, which she... That's not my question. Okay. I, I'm asking about... Let me do it this way. Okay. Is it true that in your report you recorded her statement to you as follows? She, meaning Jamie Pizarsik, was there at the house in Beverly Hills when Eric had overheard their mother talking about the hairpiece. She remembers that Eric laughed and said, I can't believe it, that's why his hair is never out of place. Is that what you wrote in your report? That's what the report says, yes. Thank you. All right, any uh, examination of this witness? Uh by the prosecution? Yes. Um, Detective Zoller interviewing Ms. Pizarsic and asking her about the cases that she had acquired for Lyle Menendez, did she use the term children getting off after killing their parents? Yes. Thank you. Nothing further. Anything else? Sure. Certainly. Thank you. Um, it is stipulated that Exhibit 327 which is a letter signed Dr. Dennis Munjak, in fact bears the handwriting of Dr. Ozeal, and a handwriting expert would so testify. It is further stipulated that the case was presented to the Los Angeles County District Attorney's Office for prosecution against Dr. Ozeal, and that the Los Angeles County District Attorney's Office declined to prosecute due to the statute of limitations. So stipulated. Okay. All right. Um, anything else before the uh, gold jury? The defense rests and it's a rebuttal. Your Honor. Okay. Never mind. I thought there was one more thing. All right. As to the uh, gold jury, then uh, I'm going to be letting you go at this point, and that's the end of the evidence phase of the trial. And the next phase of the case uh, for you will be the argument 
The lawyers will argue the case to the jury, and then I will instruct the jury. There is still uh, some matters that the lawyers and I have to resolve um, regarding the instructions I will give you on the law. And there is also some further discussion the lawyers and I have regarding uh, some of the exhibits. Um, there's about over 400 exhibits, and uh, periodically we've been reviewing them and making certain determinations as to which exhibits you will actually have with you in the jury room during your deliberations. And that discussion is still going on. That's going to happen on Monday. Um, what I'm going to do uh, is order you to return to court on Tuesday at 9 o'clock. It's possible, slightly possible, that it might be delayed until Wednesday. So what I'm going to do is ask that you uh, just make a note now. Come in Tuesday at 9 o'clock for argument. And if there is going to be a delay until Wednesday, we'll talk to you to Monday afternoon and let you know about it. Otherwise, you are all to return Tuesday at 9 o'clock for argument in this case. I'll understand Tuesday, 9 o'clock, go to the jury room, at which time argument will just start. And if we're going to change that, we'll call you and let you know Wednesday instead, OK? Which, which jury room? Uh, you, I'll, you just go back to your old, old jury room until uh, we get organized, and then we'll have you come in. All right, we'll see you back here Monday. Don't discuss this case with anyone. Don't form any final opinions about it. Don't look at any of the news coverage. We'll see you all back here Mon Tuesday. Tuesday, Tuesday, Tuesday. All right, okay. Is back in court. Um, further examination of the witness. Yes, um, Detective Zoller, do you recall during the interview that you conducted with Eric Menendez in September of 1989, you asked him if he had traveled under the name of Eric Tan. Yes. And were you aware at that time that a reservation had been made on August 31st, 1989? Objections. Is hearsay, I believe. I'm just asking what his information is. Sustained, if you're asking it. Why did you session. ask him that question? Why did you ask Eric if he had traveled, in fact, under the name of Eric Tan back to Los Angeles following the memorial service in New Jersey. Did you have such information? Yes. And uh, I'd like to mark this document, Your Honor. All right, do you have other questions of the witness on su other subjects, or is this it? Is this going to be the end of your examination, or do you have other subjects? I just have one other subject. We'll briefly. go on to the other subject, then. <laughs> November 2nd, 1993, you interviewed Jamie Pisarchik. Is that correct? Yes. And uh, did you, at some point in the interview, focus her attention on Lyle's hairpiece? Yes, I did. And did you ask her at some point in the interview if anyone else knew that Lyle had a hairpiece, particularly Eric? Yes, I did. And did she tell you that Eric didn't know from the beginning but he found out in the spring of 1989? That's correct. Now, was she sure at that point that it was the spring of 1989, or did she think it might have been the summer of 1989? I tried to pin her down on the date, and she could not give me a date, and the best she could come up with was the spring of 1989. Now, when she testified here, she said late spring or summer. Is that what she had said to you, spring or summer? Objection, argumentative. Sustained as to the form of the question. Had she said to you spring or summer? No. She just said spring? That's correct. Now, did she tell you that, well, strike that. With respect to the way this interview went, did she make that statement to you, and did you then ask her, how do you know that's when he found out? I did not ask her that question, no. All right. So did she just volunteer that she knew because she was there at the house in Beverly Hills when Eric overheard their mother talking about the hairpiece? That was my understanding, yes. Well, that's what she told you, correct? Not exactly. When when she made that statement on the stand, I reviewed my notes to see if she had stated that, and my notes don't indicate it. <coughs> then I, then I uh, tried to remember why I made that statement in the report, 
And it was my understanding that Eric found out through his mother. Well, that's what she told you. Were you making it up? No, that was my understanding. Of what she told you? Correct. She was telling you that Eric heard his mother Correct. say something? Correct. And she told you that she knew that? Correct. And she claimed to have been there at the time this is going on? Because she claims that Eric found out in the spring of 89, and she claimed she was there at the time. Correct? That's what I'm not sure about, whether she was there when the mother told him, or whether she was or was not there. Well, why don't I read you what you wrote in your report? She said that Eric didn't know from the beginning, but he found out in the spring of 1989. She was there at the house in Beverly Hills when Eric had overheard their mother talking about the hairpiece. That's what you put in your report, correct? That's correct. And you are aware that before testifying, Ms. Basarsik was given this report and asked to review it, and she did not correct that portion. I wasn't aware of that until she testified to that on the stand. All right, but you, she did testify to that on the stand. That's correct. And you didn't correct it before she testified. Section argumentative. Overall. Correct? No, I did not. And you haven't corrected it since? No, I have not. Are you trying to correct it now, during the last Objection five minutes of this trial? Sustain. Did you ask Ms. Pasarsik, um where she was at the time she supposedly had the conversation with Eric Menendez about the hairpiece? No. Did you ask her what she had been doing beforehand? I did not. In fact, you didn't ask her any questions about it at all, did you? Except, you, know, you didn't ask her any follow-up questions? No. And was this particular interview with her tape recorded? It was not. Now, with respect to your notes, uh, your notes do indicate, do they not, that uh, the time at which she supposedly had this conversation with Eric Menendez was the spring of 1989. That's correct. I might have a moment. Within a day, I believe. And within a day, um, do you dictate off your notes? I take the information from my notes. And do you often put in other information into the report that doesn't appear in the notes, but that you remember? Yes. I have, not, um, I have nothing further on this topic. I think they. All right. Why don't you question. approach on that? Just one question, you want? Yes. Detective Zoller, November 2nd, 1993, uh, Jamie Pasarsik indicated to you that it was her best approximation that she heard Eric Menendez talk about the, uh, the wig of his older brother uh, in the spring of 1989, is that correct? That's correct. So, so over four years later, she was That's estimating? Correct. Thank you. Overall, the answer will stand. Um, Show me, uh, let me approach the minister, Detective Fuller, where in your report it says it's her best approximation or she's guessing or she's estimating. Would you show me? It's not in the report. Nothing further. All right. Um, anything else? Any further evidence to be offered by the defendant, Eric Menendez? Yes, ma'am. Uh, need to recall Ms. Irwin for uh, testimony. All right. <coughs> Please get her. We're almost through, ladies and gentlemen. This will be it. This is the last witness and the last evidence, and then it will be excused. 
uh, until the argument is completed on the other defendants. So we're we're getting there. Very short more testimony. I mean for the She's here now. Let's go ahead. Why don't you get back on the witness stand, please? All right, state your name again for us. Cynthia Erdely. All right. Ms. Erdely, do you know who Antoinette Browers is? I do. Um, what's her name? You, uh, Loden. Loden? Loden? All right. Um, was, uh, what, did Antoinette Browers identify herself to you as a lieutenant of Bel Air Patrol <laughs> who was on duty at the Menendez home over several shifts? Yes. And you're aware of the fact that she was called as a witness in this case by the prosecution? Yes. And she's recently married and she has another last name now, Loden, I think. That I'm not aware of, her new last name. Okay. No. Now, in, um, do you have a copy of your report concerning your interview with Antoinette Browers with you? Yes. Would you please take it out? Now, can you tell me on, uh, first of all, did you interview Antoinette Browers? Yes. And what day did you interview her on? <coughs> on March 30th, 1993. And at the time that you interviewed her on March 30th, 1993, had she, uh, did she tell you whether or not she had yet been contacted by the police? She said she had not. And when you interviewed her on March 30th, 1993, where did the interview take place? At the offices of Bel Air Security Patrol at Bel Air Road and Sunset Boulevard. And did you have with you a Bel Air Patrol, a set of Bel Air Patrol documents? I did. And Your Honor, I have a, a three sheets, what appear to be a schedule that I'd like to mark 405. 405. And if I can approach. Ms. Erdley, showing you these three sheets, can you tell us what uh, Exhibit 405 is? That's the work schedule for 722 North Elm Drive from Bel Air Security Guard. And did you have a copy of that work schedule with you when you interviewed Antoinette Browers in March of 1993? I did. And were you pointing out to Lieutenant Browers the dates upon which the schedule indicate she worked at 722 Elm? Yes. And so was the schedule being referred to by both of you during the interview? Yes. And Ms. Erdley, with respect to your interview with Ms. Browers, did, were you trying to discern a specific fact with regard to interviewing her? Yes. And what was it you were trying to determine? Her recollections of who was at the house on specifically August 31st, September 1st, September 7th, and September 8th, if she could. Okay. And therefore, did you, did you uh, first of all, did the schedule indicate that, um, that she worked on September 1st? Yes. And uh, did the schedule indicate that she worked basically a graveyard shift where she'd come on duty just before midnight September 1st and then be on duty September, overnight to September 2nd? Correct. And did she tell you uh, that she recalled that night and going to the house that night, September yes. 1st? And did she tell you that she uh, received some information from the guard that she was relieving concerning the house that night. Jefferson calls for hearsay. Overall. Yes. And what did she tell you in that regard? That she was informed there was no one in the house. When she got there on September 1st? Yes. And did she tell you that um, at the beginning of a shift, she would always do a tour with the guard who was going off? and be advised as to whether there were people in the house and where they were? Yes. And did she indicate that that occurred when she worked that night, September 1st? Yes. 
Now, did you also discuss with her uh, the information on the schedule concerning September 7th? Yes. And uh, what shift does the schedule for September 7th indicate? It shows she worked a day shift that started at 8 a.m. And now, on, with respect to that date, did she indicate whether or not she saw any family member and any friends of family members at the house? Yes. Uh, just to back up for a minute, did she claim to you, when you interviewed her in March, to have seen Eric Menendez on the morning of September 2nd? No. Did she claim to you that she saw any friend of Eric Menendez's on the morning of September 2nd? No. Now, with respect to September 7th, did she tell you that she did see uh, a friend of Eric's at the house after she got there on September 7th? Yes. And did she describe to you what that friend was wearing on September 7th? Yes. And what was it? Jeans and a t-shirt. Did she ever describe to you seeing Eric Menendez or any friend of Eric's in uh, sleepwear or pajamas or a robe or anything like that? No. Now, when you uh, interviewed Ms. Browers on March 30th, 1993, did you interview other Bel Air Patrol officers at the same time? Is that actually irrelevant? Overall, you can say that yes or no to that. Yes. And were you discussing the schedules with them as well? Yes. And was she present when you were discussing the schedule with other officers? No. So did you interview each one individually? Yes. I have nothing further. Cross-examination. Thank you, Your Honor. Ms. Browers, you have no, a, a report. This, this is Ms. Erdely. Yeah, sorry. I know, it's getting late. <laughs> Ms. Erdely, about Ms. Browers. You have a report, a three-page report? Yes. Is that right? Now, you don't have it dated, do you? It's dated on a cover sheet. That's why I didn't have it. Go look at the cover sheet. Okay, may I approach you? Yes. Did you uh, tape record this uh, interview? No. And I suppose you have a motion this interview too? Yes. Um, did you check your notes before you testified today? No, I referred to my report. Typed report, I'm sorry. So when you went to talk to Antoinette Browers on the 30th of uh, March, you had notes from the interview, and then you made a report from it, correct? I think the question's confusing, Your Honor. All right, let's move on. Okay. Did you ask her specific questions about whether or not anyone had been uh, in the room that she was not aware of, in Eric Menendez's bedroom? Your Honor, I don't understand the question. Rephrase the question. Okay. You were asked specifically about two dates, September 1st and <coughs> September 7th, I believe, and 8th, or three dates. Is that correct? Four dates okay. altogether. Specifically, though, September 1st. Correct. That was one of them. And did you ask whether she had ever knocked on Eric Menendez's uh, bedroom? No. To summons him for, for anything? You never asked her, her about that? It wasn't a necessary question. She already described the condition of the house to me, that there was no one there, and she made her tour. I have nothing to do Anything else? No. All right, you may step down. Any further evidence to be offered by the defendant, Eric Mendez? All right. It is stipulated that exhibit 327, a letter bearing the signature of Dr. De Dennis Lunjack um, has been examined by a question document examiner and been found to contain the handwriting of Dr. Jerome Ozeal. It is further stipulated that the case against Dr. Ozeal was taken to the Los Angeles County District Attorney's Office by the State Bureau of Consumer Affairs and that the District Attorney's Office declined to prosecute the case against Dr. Ozeal due to the statute of limitations. 
so stipulated. And I'd just like to mark the American Express gold card of Mark Heffernan as 400. No. Is it 400? No. No, no, way ahead of there. I think we're at 406. No, I, oh, I you had previously mark marked it as 400. This is the American Express record. Yes. Is that it? Yes. Oh. We're going to reserve it for the blue jug. And I have two stipulations um, with respect to this jury. The counsel, will you stipulate that Craig Signorelli's phone number in August and September of 1989 was area code 818-888-1273 out of Canoga Park, and that Carlos Menendez's phone number was area code 201 431 1257 out of Freehold, New Jersey. Yes, so stipulated. Anything else? All right, there is no further evidence to be offered on Surabuttle or on uh, in the case of People versus Eric Mendez. That's the end of all of the evidence. The argument uh, will be for the gold jury first. The reason I wanted to keep you here was because uh, we won't need you back here until uh, the argument for the gold jury is completed. And uh, first of all, let me say that it's very important that, um, as I've said to you before, that you make your decision based only on the evidence you hear in this courtroom and my instructions on the law. And it's very important that you not be concerned about what goes on when you're out of the courtroom and any evidence or argument or proceedings that relate to uh, the other defendant. Your goal and role is to decide the case of People versus Eric Menendez alone and make that decision based on the evidence you have heard and my instructions on the law. So during the time there is argument going on involving the other defendant, uh, it's even more important at that stage that you not concern yourself and not be made aware of what's going on and wait until you get back here for the argument involving the case of Eric Menendez, which uh, will take place. Yes. Um, all right, sure. This, just to finish off my remarks, um, as far as your return date, um, I'm going to ask that you return on Friday of next week with the understanding that it's possible that uh, we won't need you until the following Monday. So, um, what we'll do is let you know as the week progresses uh, whether we're going to need you uh, Friday, which is uh, the 10th, or Monday the 13th. Um, at this point, just to uh, keep everybody uh, uh, aware of the next date, I want you to make note to be here Friday at 9 o'clock. But if it looks like we're not going to get to the argument for you folks until Monday, we'll call you and have you come in Monday at 9 o'clock. And um, by a little later uh, next week, or even the early part of next week, we should be in a better position to know exactly when we'll want you, either Friday or Monday. But at this point, uh, make a note, we'll want you back on Friday, unless you hear otherwise. So that's it uh, for the uh, testimony. I'm sorry to keep you here so late, but it was necessary to get this thing done so that we can get to the next phase of the trial. And uh, again, don't discuss this case with anyone. Don't form any final opinions about it. There is still the argument and my instructions before you can deliberate and go into the jury room and discuss it among yourselves. And don't uh, permit yourselves to be exposed to anything about this case in any form whatsoever outside of the courtroom. Have a good weekend, a good week, and we'll see you next Friday unless we hear otherwise. You hear otherwise.